and gentlemen, welcome to the program. I am your host, Chris George Zuger, and you have entered the den of lore. Grab your glasses of scotch, pull your chair up to the fire, because we're going to learn some cool shit tonight, courtesy of one of the up-and-coming stars in alternative history in the world today. This is Global Mail best-selling author Bruce R. Fenton, and we're going to be discussing the Into Africa Theory of Human Evolution, his new book that is out on Amazon right now. You can get it on Kindle. I believe you can still get it in uh, hard copy as well as uh, well, soft copy. I guess that, that would be the Kindle. <laughs> You can get it right now. The link is in the show notes. Uh, I've been uh, tearing through it as much as I can over the last couple of days. And this has been the show I've been excited, really excited for since I first started talking to him back in uh, December. And, uh, you know, I know that we're going to have a fantastic evening. So buckle up. Uh, You know, and um, it's been a wild, wild month. This has been the first month back since... My uh, daughter was born, and, um, you know, I, I have to thank for a lot of the guests who've been on the show have given me a lot of good advice, and uh, Bruce is one of them, <laughs> so <laughs> for, for anybody out there who is a dad, uh, man, I, I feel for you, or if you're a parent, I feel for you 100%. It's, uh, it's the greatest thing you'll ever do, but at the same time, probably one of the most stressful. <laughs> man, jeez, whew. So, and speaking of one of the most wonderful things you can do, one of the most wonderful things our followers do is support the show. Uh, We we are a 100% listener-supported show in alternative media. We do not have corporate sponsors. We do not take corporate money to have commercials on this show so we can say whatever the fuck we want whenever the fuck we want to, just like you guys like it. And if it weren't for our patrons... Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this show week in, week out. So I wanted to give a special thanks to our patrons, uh, specifically our masters and illustrious masters, to our illustrious masters, Jackie from Across the Pond and Pat from Brooklyn. Uh, Pat, your shirt is coming. Uh, once I can actually get an hour or two of sleep in, then I will send you your design and we'll, we'll get you December's uh, shirt because he won the patron contest that we run every single month. And to our masters, Lee Veltman, Chuck Schwartz, Frederick Johnson, Jared Thompson, Mrs. Fox, Roses, Wayne, Joshua E. Maddock, Mark Catalano, and our den mother, Ellen McCurdy, as well as Dobermere, who uh, recently uh, joined our uh, masters program, and to the rest of our patrons, Nick Zed, Charles Davis, Diago Bauer, Michael Eckhoff, Dean John Kenward, Anthony Derry, Atlantic Kush, Venice from Magical Egypt, Christopher Moody, Robin Webley, and courtesy of denoflore.com's PayPal button hobby. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Please do not hesitate, if you're a first-time listener, to hitting that subscribe button and share this out to your friends. And, you know, I think it's about time that I get to the camera on here. There we go. And welcome our wonderful guest, Bruce, onto the air. Bruce, how are you doing tonight? Or, you doing tonight? I, I, sh- I should say, how are you doing are you today? It's, 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 it's the morning here. Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, uh, looking forward to a, a chat on one of my favorite subjects, lecturing on, um, you know, I won't make it a lecture, but no, chat, chatting on uh, yeah, human origins, all our ancestors. Yep, should be interesting. Uh, no. For, for like, for, I know a lot of people out there. They're used to hearing um, names such as Graham Hancock or Laird Scranton mm-hmm. uh, thrown around yeah. in the alternative history field. Uh, you're mm-hmm. th- one of the relatively newer authors who has uh, begun releasing work uh, in a completely separate, mm-hmm. but still parallel field. Um, and mm-hmm. your book actually does have an introductory chapter or an intro by Graham Hancock as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it does. Yeah, he was very he was very kind in um, providing the forward to the book, um, and you know I know he was pressed for time to do it, so I, I really appreciate him you know taking time out to do that because um, he was actively researching you know for his own books. Um, so yeah, I was lucky. I was lucky. I managed to catch him with just enough time to do that. And now, how did you start with the subject matter of your of this this book? I know that we've um, heard many lectures on. Uh, ancient history dealing with 12,860 BC, but we haven't yeah. necessarily heard much about our uh, much deeper antiquity uh, besides, mm-hmm. let's say, Michael Cremo and 
um, forbidden archaeology. So this this is a, a relatively mm-hmm. untouched subject because mm-hmm. a lot of the times when we uh, touch on this subject from certain authors, we get into a lot of woo-woo bullshit dealing with yeah. space aliens who are baby reptilians who may have come mm-hmm. here to mine gold or what have you. There's been no real mm-hmm. hard science in it. And you, yeah, you, yeah. you've taken a very mm-hmm. good rational approach to the subject matter. Um, how, how did you get into the subject matter to, to begin with? Because it, it seems like a very interesting part of human mm-hmm. history to start. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you're right there that um, it's not a sort of a, a subject area that alternative researchers, you know, or at least non-academics would normally touch. Um, apart from, as you've said, you know, there's a couple of good examples and probably a handful of bad examples where people have done that, but they they don't supply the evidence. So to my work, yeah, it is quite different. Um, and that came about really, I, I was involved with um, like a, a megalithic site in Ecuador and I was living in Ecuador for about five years. Uh, and by by a strange sort of coincidence, you know, I'd probably been there about four months and I ended up at um, in a conversation with this local, like a local shamanic healer who I was, could we like come along, talk to them at a restaurant, you know, about something they had going on, uh, something we had going on as well. And, but there was going to be another couple there and that, that it was OK if they were there. And I thought, yeah, sure, you know, no problem. And it turned out this other couple, the guy had just come back from the jungle with a team and they had found this um, like megalithic site in the jungle. So I was like probably one of the first people to hear about it. And I must be like the only English speaking you know, researcher probably for like a thousand miles from the guy. I mean, so it was one of those really sort of strange synchronous, you know, synchronicity type events where you're like, well, I must be supposed to know about this. And, um, and so I got involved with that, ended up trekking out to the site a couple of times. Uh, he thought it was a lost city of giants because of the size of some of the artifacts that they found, um, like large pestle and mortar and some sort of hammer looking objects, you know, so I can't say exactly what they are, but they're, they're very large. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of how it began in a way, because then I, I began researching, you know, who could have built this site? You know, what was the backstory? And that led me to a, a group of people called the Lagoa Santa down in Brazil, because supposedly they'd come up through the Amazon uh, and ended up in Ecuador and had literally sort of founded the first human communities in the region where this site was. And so, and, and these guys, they lead you on again because their their skull morphology, like the shape of the skull, is considered to be australoid. Um, so really, their evidence of a, a proto population in the Americas that came from sort of Oceania, you know, Australia, uh, New Zealand, you know, that that kind of region. They've come out of that area, ended up in South America. So. You know, it was a fascinating story and I had to fit that into the context of, you know, where does that fit with out of Africa? You know, what are these people doing there? Um, and I, I, I was struggling to make sense of it because some of the dates for them go back to maybe 50, 60,000 years ago down in South America. I mean, those are controversial dates, but they are, you know, dates that have arisen from archaeology, not from, you know, somebody just making them up and saying, you know, I think there was people in America. You know, they, they found mm-hmm. um, charcoal in fires and they found, you know, cave art that, you know, things that, that seem to suggest this early presence um and so i wanted to validate that so i, I did some background checking and my background checking spiraled into a total reevaluation of the existing you know, model now australoid uh that's referring to the term proto-australoid meaning the, the mm-hmm. first used by uh dixon um with regards mm-hmm. to uh, the indigenous individuals from from australia it is yeah uh, now i i know that we we've had uh, a couple of researchers who are researching the um, uh, the cone, the, the cone skulls uh, of uh, mm-hmm. Paracas, and there's been a lot of state or a lot of indication that there has been some uh, migration through the Polynesian islands from, uh, mm-hmm. you know, from from Australia, from uh, uh, Western or uh, Eastern Asia into South America from that side. Um, mm-hmm. Now you're, which, you know, they're they're mm-hmm. dealing with dates some some as far back as let's say thirty thousand. Uh, BC, but you're you're dealing with around the the two hundred to three hundred thousand, give or take, probably a little bit earlier than that. Um, how how did you first start looking at the dates? Uh, because they're they're a little different mm-hmm. in what you've written compared to what's out in mainstream science. Yeah, I mean, I you know I went through the conventional papers. I mean, in a way, in one mistake I prob- I perhaps made is I didn't really look for for other scientists that were offering you know I guess counter views you know I, I looked at the mainstream view 
and then assessed that and came up with what I considered to be sort of glaring anomalies and holes in their theory. I, I now understand there were other scientists out there who I probably could have connected with who've already supplied papers noticed because they've also noticed mm -hmm. that there's some really big holes in the model. I mean, I, I covered the period going back for, to about seven million years ago, uh, up until about 20,000 years ago. Um, obviously, some parts of that I've covered in more depth than others. I mean, the early part is really just to, well, I like continuity, you know, I mean, I, I so for well, when do we have these first hominins, you know, so to be kind of complete, you know, I had a quick look at that. Um, and there's arguments over when the first hominins arose, because, I mean, you look at some of these really early examples and, you know, I'm not convinced that they're hominins. You know, I think that they're primates. Um, and I feel a lot of this, you know, you can see a lot of scientists also dispute this. I think until about four or five million years ago, we don't really have anything that we can we can say is really a hominin, in my view. Um, so I, I kind of cover that period onwards uh, in a bit more depth um, and then all the way up to about 20,000 years ago. So um, dates for me, really, yeah, it started with the date. I needed to check to see how could, you know, Australian type people have ended up in the Americas up to about 50, 60,000 years ago. You know, was that plausible? And if it was plausible, how does that impact the wider out of Africa theory? So that's kind of the date range I started at. But I did do a broad sweeping look through the timeline. Now, I, I, one thing that I did want to bring up, and I know that um, uh, some of our listeners would absolutely kill me afterwards if I didn't, uh, which is mm. the, uh, th this was released by ABC News uh, recently, and I think it was also a National Geographic that mm. would, with regards to the uh, ancient jawbone that was found in Israel, uh, which yep. is showing that, or at least the, the title states that uh, humans left Africa around 180,000 years ago. It's supposed to be the oldest um, uh, fossilized sapien remains found mm. outside of Africa uh, within that time period, how, yeah. how does how does this um, relate to uh, the in, into Africa theory? Is it mm -hmm. more of a proof of concept, or is it more of a well? It's kind of an anomaly. Uh, you know, it's something that that may not necessarily need to be looked at. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I first thing I suppose an honest review of that find would be that. We don't know if it, you know, we don't know if that population had recently come out of Africa. We don't know if it was recently going in towards Africa, and we don't know if it descended from a group that had been in Eurasia for a much longer period. And this is one of the problems I have with the media and the way it reports things: is there's there's always that initial statement when our ancestors came out of Africa, or or this makes it, you know, an earlier point when we came out of Africa. But but nobody actually offers you evidence that supports that opening sentence because you know it's now assumed that we have to just take that for granted and, and that's one of the reasons why graham hancock was willing to write the forward because you know he makes that point in the forward that it's the one area of like paleoanthropology that nobody questions that they'll have these raging wars over you know is this chinese fossil important or not you know but but when it comes to the the out of africa part it's just you're given like a two sentence statement and it is not clarified why that is at all. And uh, I, so I dispute the way they've interpreted that because there's multiple interpretations. From my point of view, I mean, I argued in my book that there was a migration heading towards Africa 200,000 years ago. So yes, this evidence fits very well with something I, you know, I've expected. I expect to find more Homo sapiens fossils dating around 200,000 years ago all across Eurasia. Um, and one of the reasons why we don't see them between the Levant and East Asia, because we, we have them in East Asia, we have them in China, you know, we have them now in the Levant. We don't see them in the middle, but that's largely because I bet, you know, if we went and researched, you know, how much money is going into that research in some of those countries in between the two, you're going to find that they are not spending a lot of cash on looking for hominin fossils. I mean, there's some, you know, there's some very poor countries, there's some problematic countries, you know, there's vast areas of Central Asia where I don't think people are looking for these. Um, so we get this kind of skewed view as well that, well, they're only in the Levant or they're only in China. It's like, well, that's not really realistic because one way or the other, they're even moving east or west across Eurasia to, to get to these places, whether you go out of Africa or you take my view and you're coming out of sort of Australasia and Southeast Asia, you know, they still need to pass through all of Eurasia. Mm -hmm. So those fossils have to be there. And um, I think as people start to look for them, we're going to find that there's a, a much more complex picture. Uh, and I think that we're going to see that there's, you know, hominins and, and homo sapiens widespread in Eurasia 200,000 years ago. Well, what exactly is the timeline? Can, can you take us through... Um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a brief overview of, of, of what the migration was like. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, there's a couple of different major phases. So from my perspective, 
I would say that you know the, the first thing we need to know is, okay, primate ancestors, they've moved up from East Asia and Southeast Asia around about 35 million years ago. They've headed through, through Eurasia. Uh, there's some important stages of development, you know, even up to about 15, year, 15 million years ago, 10 million years ago, they're happening down in, in basically in sort of Eurasia and Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, obviously some finds recently have sort of supported that. There's been some 7 million year old hominin fossils found down in, I think it's Greece. Uh, and also some footprints, you know, of a hominin down in the same sort of area. Uh, and we know that there was a key stage in our development down there, but it's considered to be, um, you know, a primate ancestor. Uh, but then soon after that, we have the first hominins in Africa. So we've had this first into Africa from Asia going all the way back to maybe seven million years ago. Right. And then you have the development of the first hominins seems to occur in Africa. And I, I don't really dispute that. As far as I can see, they enter Africa. The evolution continues there. And, you know, we have these these initial proto kind of humans um, that emerge within that period of seven million to four million years ago. And these, this includes like the Australopithecines that people might have heard about there. They're, they're, you know, they're fairly obviously, you know, early humans, if you like. You know, they're, they're obviously bipedal. Uh, they're starting to take the, sort of the form. You know, they have more of our features, some of them even beginning to, um, you know, grow larger brains and stuff. They're still pretty small. The brains are pretty, you know, contemporaneous with chimpanzee brains, but they're starting to increase. Mm-hmm. Um, and so after that, then really the, the key stage for me is at 1.8 to 2 million years ago, we have Homo erectus appears on the scene uh, and he, he actually leaves, you know, well, he and she, you know, they leave Africa around about 1.8 million years ago. Uh, and we know that because we have fossils in Georgia, you know, Demancy, which they found you know, five skulls there, um, which show that, you know, these, these people have left Africa much earlier than it was long suspected. And then there's, a, there's another group within Africa. And that, at this point, they break them up into two groups. There's Homo agaster in Africa and Homo erectus that's moving out into Eurasia. Uh, and the, these, these people kind of spread all the way down to Southeast Asia by about 1.7, 1.8 million years ago. So we can kind of infer that they've left, I think, at least 2 million years ago from Africa to get down to Southeast Asia. It's quite a, it's quite a hike if you think a slow expansion. Um, they're also in in Spain by about 1.4 million years ago. So they're they're literally kind of colonizing all of Eurasia, uh, a very widespread species. Uh, they even reach, you know, into the Indonesian islands by about a million years ago. You know, we've got tools on Flores, which are assumed to be Homo erectus, and they're there at one million years ago. So they've really gone pretty much everywhere by a million years ago. Um, where I differ that, you know, from the out of Africa in this is, is they say that the people to watch in this story are the Homo agaster, the ones who haven't done anything, haven't gone anywhere, have stuck in the same place, you know, have no real driver to change, are well adapted to where they live. But these are the ones that are supposed to be in the rapid process of evolution towards modern humans. Right. I struggle with that because right there you see some lack of common sense because we know that evolution is driven by adaptation, you know, right? It's driven by your environments. It's driven by problems and change. So, like, who's encountering more of these pressures to evolve? The guy who stays at home and does nothing, right? Or the guy that's out there, you know, that's doing all this stuff, has to climb over the mountains of Eurasia and is, like, wandering down and sailing off into Indonesia. I think that they have a little bit more pressure to adapt, right? Uh, and so this is what I say out of Africa for me has happened 1.8 million years ago. Right. And this is when our ancestors have left. I don't buy this story that, you know, these people that like literally have done nothing except be well adapted to where they've stayed are the best candidates. And so this this to me then is, you know, again, why with these articles, I have a problem because when they say that, you know, oh, it looks like, you know, our ancestors left like 50,000 years earlier. I'm like, no, our ancestors left 1.8 million years ago. So, you know, don't fob us off with this story that, you know, that they're just coming out recently. Um, And this is where there's a huge divide between my argument and not just my argument. There's other people that, you know, other academics that have argued this as well, said that they think Homo erectus is a much better candidate. And that when we look down in um, so Southeast Asia, we see, you know, there's adaptation, there's changes. We see um, new forms arising. We also see in Europe, we see a number of new forms arising as they, they transition towards what's called Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, and this is like a, you know, a, really is an early Neanderthal. Uh, there's another similar form which may well be becoming Denisovans, but we don't have Denisovan skulls identified yet, so we don't know. But there's um, some anomalous skulls which may be early Denisovans down in China, uh, and also some transitional, you know, like what looks like transitional Homo sapiens, early Homo sapiens down in Asia as well. Um, so it, it's certainly to me the story is external to Africa. Now, with regards to the Denisovians, uh, this is a, a branch of, of uh, sapiens that 
uh, are not necessarily very well known because we've only found uh, very few remains. And I know most of them have mm-hmm. been found in, in northern um, uh, in northern Russia, um, in Siberia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, how do th- how do they fit into the the overall um, you know the the overall branch? Some people say that they could have been mm-hmm. Neanderthal, uh, uh, you know, sapien mix, or it was because of mm-hmm. the mixture between Neanderthal and Denisovians that uh, uh, Homo sapiens came about. Although they they're supposed to be a branch off of the Neanderthal line, are they not? Well, well they're closer related. Yeah, they what they now think is that having looked again at the genetics, I mean, fairly recently. They've come to the conclusion that it, it appears that the last time that we sort of definitively shared a common ancestor with you know all three of us, the three species or subspecies, was around about 750,000 years ago, certainly in the period, say, 800 to 700,000 years ago. Um, and that what happened is one split occurs and, the, and that split soon after it, it splits again into Den- the early Denisovans and early Neanderthals. And that we just like... Um, I think it's about a few, just about 5,000 years later that, you know, our line sort of branches off from that common ancestor. So, it, you know, it's fairly close. And again, their, their split is also fairly close. So everything's kind of happening around in that period, say 750 to 700,000 years ago, that all three of these groups have split away down their own line. So they're all fairly close in time. Um, and so they would have been, you know, very similar. I mean, we talk about the beginning, three very similar you know, groups that would have been, if we saw them, they would have looked the same, you know, uh, and that those changes in the morphology and the way they look would have occurred sort of, you know, over that following 700,000 years, you know, so we've obviously, we've began to move into def- different geographic regions and obviously being isolated encourages, you know, specific racial or, or not even racial, but specific sort of subspecies morphology. So we have, I say racial, because race, race doesn't get thrown out, which is really more of a social construct. But but we have, you know, morphology, we'll have skull shape changes, we'll have changes to their 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 genes, you know, there's things that are going to happen over that time. Um, so really, Denisovans are as, as unique as we are, and as Neanderthals are, but they certainly are slightly closer related to Neanderthals than to us. Um, so really, the, the exciting part of the story, if you like, is happening in that period. For me, it's, it's happening around about 750,000 years ago. Um, something there, which I consider anomalous in my view, uh, something happens which causes, you know, Homo erectus or something very much like a Homo erectus to suddenly diversify into multiple, you know, hominin lines, which will go on to be, you know, advanced humans with, you know, higher cognitive thinking and, you know, they each express their art, their language, you know, it seems like they're that tr- that trigger comes on, you know, around about that time. I, I believe it was uh, Terence McKenna who postulated the theory of uh, uh, apes taking mushrooms and mm-hmm. that being a part of the evolutionary um, uh, process for them to actually start having their brains grow in mm-hmm. size. Uh, it, I, I guess that would give uh, a, a good uh, a good term to the or <laughs> a good name to the term mm-hmm. high technology. If yeah, true. Yeah, his stoned ape theory. Yeah, he yeah. would be a high technology, and I, I don't see why they wouldn't have stumbled on on some of these plants. Him. But um, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm not sort of married to that theory. But I, I mean, I'm certainly open minded to. It. I think that we would have encountered, you know, hallucinogenic plants early in the story. I mean, it's uh, you know, as it's been pointed out, you know, it's we're looking for food. You know, cows provide food. You know, and their cow pats grow magic mushrooms. Mushrooms are food. You know, you can kind of see how it would be at some point inevitable that we would come across magic mushrooms, for example. I mean, and there, obviously there are other, you know, plants which cause hallucinogenic states, even poisonous plants, you know, that if you eat small amounts, then you don't die, you know, that you'll still have these experiences. So, I mean, it's, I think it's quite likely that, yeah, that those plants have played a role. And I think that anyone is, who has used hallucinogenic plants, you know, and I've, you know, I've used, you know, a, a sort of plethora of, of hallucinogenic plants myself. And some people say, well, that's probably why you come with these, we've, we've all these strange theories, ones. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so, maybe but I can see, into- I can see, yeah, that they would have impacted us. <laughs> It's, oh, it, you know, it, it's like a, for for friends who will like get to get together and, you know, get around that fire and, you know, they'll mm-hmm. have a few beers. It, it, you look back at the same way in, in terms of history and, and human evolution mm-hmm. and, and our um, the way that we are just as beings in, in terms of our human nature. Mm-hmm. We always just tend to like just get really fucked up around fires. It, it, ju- it just yeah. works. And then just yeah. tell stories. And sometimes you come yeah, up with the craziest ideas. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to think, OK, well, if. 
you know, did, did, did the Denisovians do the same thing? Did Homer, you know, Homer Rectus do something very similar? What was their language like? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, did, did they just get really off on on fermented berries that they found? You know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, changing tack with that, what? How, how did the Intergla- the glacial periods within the last, or at least the current ice age, uh, factor into the migration patterns. Uh, we're we're currently in an inter- interglacial period ourselves, and mm-hmm. you know they last sometimes fifty thousand, sometimes about a hundred thousand years. But you know if if we're talking timelines as far back as two million years ago, that was around the start of the of, of the initial large ice age period that we that we're currently still in. Uh, have mm-hmm. Have you noticed any any differences? within the migratory patterns that had corresponded with uh, any of the, um, you know, glaciers either receding or uh, encroaching on territory? Did, was, this, was this a factor? Well, definitely, definitely climate environment has been a major factor. I mean, there's, there's times when, you know, our species is really being sort of clobbered. I mean, if you go back to about 1.2 million years ago to a million years ago, in that period, we were down, they think, to perhaps maybe 10,000 people you know globally and that that's including of any form of of hominin you know that so these weren't necessarily just our ancestors but you know, they, they think that there was like about ten thousand humans of any sort on the planet you know something had had literally sort of pushed us towards extinction i mean that's likely to be an obviously climatic and environmental factors to do with what was happening at the time um so you know we have been sort of almost driven to extinction previously um and such things have, ha- have recurred you know again at 800,000 years ago there was major climate shifts and in fact again that's to me 800,000 years ago is an anomalous kind of time um actually my wife's kind of working on a book about that now which will you know I'll flag up to you when it's done but oh, kind of do. focusing a bit on that period and I'm helping her with that because you have massive climate instability at this point you do have um a period of if I'm rightly that you know you've got sea level you know huge sea level swings you know you've got obviously changes in the temperature you know you've got all these factors and this also just precedes that that point where these new hominins appear so it it does seem that you know what's happening in the environment may well be playing a role in this sudden change you know in what we are as a you know as a being Uh, and i think that's partly because when you have sort of small populations if there's a mutation right it spreads through the population really fast so you can see that when we get clobbered by, you know, like extensive ice, you know, or we get clobbered by sudden sea level rises or whatever it is, you know, that that it, it does influence the evolution of the species quite a lot. And it's sort of surprising. People would think, well, why is that? But it's good. Yeah, all it takes is one advantageous mutation. So that allows you to survive the cold and then you and your line survive, you know, and the other lots, they all die. They die in droves. And so, you know, suddenly this mutation is, you know, is, is within everyone that survives. So you have a, a kind of a new human form being sort of molded by that environment. So I do think, yeah, I think it's played a huge role. And, and again, later on in the story, to sort of jump forward, it's sort of 73,000 years ago, you know, you've got the Lake Toba supervolcano. And, and that, you know, it's been a huge driver in the climate. The climate was already cooling at this point, which has been sort of well recognized. But but Toba then explodes, accelerates that cooling trend by throwing up all this dust and gas and, you know, and drives the northern hemisphere into this like super winter, uh, like nuclear winter. And so anyone like living north, you know, north of the equator is is basically being sort of eradicated by this combination of, you know, of um, where you'd have increased darkness you know so obviously plants are dust many types of plants and trees are dying obviously the animals that depend on them die on top of that you've got acid rain a lot of your drinking water is now contaminated um and this intense cold you know so you can imagine the effects it had on humans and you know it's been fairly well recognized that the human population plummets in numbers at this time and um that this is like bottleneck event and again when there's these bottleneck events we see the the emergence of new traits and new types of humans. And funnily enough, really, that, that period coincides with what I would consider the emergence of fully, you know, fully, fully modern humans. And I think before that, we seem to have a sort of a, a mix of different kinds of fairly modern human. Um, but I think, you know, they're, they're driven into survival areas. And then in survival areas, obviously, they, the, the remaining people interbreed. So what you end up with a more homogenous population that was once widespread and diverse when you push them all into one place 
you know, into like one town's area, or so, you know, you're not going to end up with a very diverse population anymore because, as we know, people interbreed, they mix, and you end up with a homogenous, you know, population, which is what we have obviously more in the world today now because of the way we're all interlinked. We're starting to be more homogenous. So, so I think it's kind of it's it's kind of funny the way these you know, the climate factors have driven the emergence of our of our form. Now, I, I know that um, with the migration that uh, out of Australia about 60,000 years ago, uh, you know, at that point we had, I think some estimates are 20 to 30,000 uh, uh, modern humans left at that point. Some some put it as high as around 50 or 60,000 worldwide. Mm-hmm. Uh, there have been some theories that have been postulated based on, um, you know, similar theories dealing with uh, comet impacts and how uh, mass extinctions with uh, with megafauna uh, can be mitigated depending on the type of climate and where it's actually, uh, you know, where where it's actually placed. Mm-hmm. And Africa seems to be one of the more um, hospitable places, especially sub-Saharan mm-hmm. Africa. It seems to insulate uh, the changes within the environment a lot better. Mm-hmm. Now, did did you have you noticed any uh, differences within the data between the uh, blood types and haplogroups from Australia to Africa at that point? Are there any um, similarities that, or is it is there still a an indication that there was re migration back into Africa at that point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you look at the differences, the first thing is that you notice that sub-Saharan Africans and Australian Aboriginals are the two most divergent populations on the planet, right? So although people would look and think, oh well, you know, these are just another group of Black Africans, you know, on the face of it, you know, it'd be an easy assumption to make. But when you look at the DNA, you find that no, these are the two most divergent, and that you know the the Europeans and Asians are far closer to, um, particularly to Australian Aboriginals, but also even to Africans than they than these two groups are to each other. So I mean, they've been you know separated for a very long time and in fact the the evidence suggests that the separation is at least 72,000 years old right and that's a funny date because we've just talked about toba right which has happened at 73,000 years ago so it, in my argument i say well look what's happened here is not so much a migration right but but you if you imagine you've got a population that stretches from africa through eurasia down to Australia, okay, and there's there's interbreeding. So you've got gene flow, which is going right across the region, which keeps us again fairly homogenous because you're passing on traits across the region. And then a volcano goes off, you know, the climate plummets. Most of those people in Eurasia die. So you've severed that link between Africa and Australia. And funnily enough, at that date, you see evidence of a divergence of these two populations. You know, and so you can take that as, well, was there a migration? I don't think it took a migration. It just took an awful lot of people dying in between. And that's why, you know, because there's an assumption sometimes, oh, you know, people are moving around, moving around. It's not always, you know, it's not always that simple. I think that the model better reflects this separation being due to Toba because of the, the date. I mean, it's just so close. And at the same dating, right, is when you see the, you see in Africa, well, in the African modern genome, you find there's these these two haplogroups, uh, one on the Y chromosome on the male line, one on the mtDNA line, right, which, which are considered to be ancestral to all living Eurasians, right? So you have on the MT line, you have L3, right? And then on the Y chromosome, you have CT. And right, so you find that these are considered basal or at, the re- or at the base at the root of modern Eurasians. Okay, so this is where this out of Africa theory kind of stems from, is from the genetics, because they say, well, look, it's around 70,000 years ago, we can see this marker in, in modern Africans, and we can see that this is, you know, so closely related to the Eurasian lines, which are you know, on, the, on the, the MT line are considered M and N, basically, for people that don't know. Um, and then I think CE on the male line. They seem to emerge from the same, you know, original haplogroups. Say, so, well, look, if they're in the Africans at about 70,000 years ago, surely that means the Eurasians have come out of Africa, right? So this is kind of logical inference. It, it, it's not evident. And people would say to me, DNA proves we came out of Africa. Well, that's total bullshit because the first thing you have to say is, right, the oldest DNA sample we have from an African fossil is 8,000 years old. Tell me how an 8,000-year-old sample can place your ancestors 70,000 years ago. Right? I'm not even sure. I don't see how. No, it, if, it, for, yeah, the, <laughs> the, for, forget, the, forget the difference in, in time. Um, 
it, like have they gotten uh, DNA samples from from anything uh, younger than that, uh, or I should say anything older than that from from anywhere around Africa? Elsewhere, like... yeah, elsewhere. The, the oldest samples of modern human DNA are about forty five thousand years old, and they're from sort of from Eastern Europe, like Romania, and up in Siberia, right? So we, we get more information from those. But those, of course, they can't place us in Africa. They can only place us in Romania and in Siberia. Again, so unless you have like 80,000-year-old fossils in Africa that have DNA, then you don't have ancestral DNA, right? So, so what they did instead is they inferred. They thought, well, probably the ancestors of these modern Africans were probably in Africa at, at that point 70,000 years ago. And because they have this, this genome, which is ancestral to Eurasians, Probably we must have come out of Africa. Now, it seems on the face of it logical, but let me put in a little bit of logic here that, that changes that. You've got an enormous climate event in Eurasia. It's killing everyone, right? Do you stay and die, or are you going to move away from the problem? Like, I'm going to move my family away from the problem, right? Because if, if you can see that the people to the east are coming to you and saying, man, it is fucking bad to the east, you want to head west, we're dying, you know, everyone's dead out there. Which way are you going to go? You're going to go west, right? And so the other people to the Far East, you know, if they're alive, I mean, these people have been hit really bad by Toba. If they're alive, they need to get into Australia, right? So there's, there's basically two survival zones. You can get into sub, sub-equatorial Africa and survive, or you can get into Australasia and survive. Nearly everyone else is going to die, right? So the motivation for you to go out of Africa is zero, right? But your motivation to go into Africa is enormous, right? Because you're being pushed along by like bleak hellscape conditions. And at, at exactly at this point, we see the African genome change. We see these haplotypes appear right in the African genome because the people have crossed from Eurasia. They have fled into Africa over the Babel Mandab Straits. And we first detect this, this new genome in, in Africans in East Africa at 70,000 years ago because these are people fleeing into Africa who are mating with the local population, right? And this is just common sense logic. And as we don't have that archaic DNA, there is no argument against what I'm saying. And so, so people will tell us, that, yeah, but, but, but haven't they got this? No, they haven't got the ancient DNA. It's always been spun as that, yeah, DNA proof. No, it doesn't prove it. If you've got 8,000 year old DNA, you can prove where that person was 8,000 years ago and no further back. What about some of the findings that people have used artifacts to try and date mm -hmm. to uh, either Homo erectus, Neanderthal, or some other branch of humanity within different parts of the world, such as the, the San Diego findings, which are being dated to about 130,000 years? Is there mm -hmm. uh, you know anything that can explain that? Because you know the, the standard model, which obviously is becoming less and less credible per mm -hmm. day, which is uh, a migration over the Bering yeah. Strait uh, during, mm -hmm. uh, during the last, um, uh, right before the Younger Dryas period. Mm -hmm. It seems that it would have been fairly difficult uh, and for, for somebody to, well, I'm, I'm going to say, I don't know how advanced we were. You know, I don't know how advanced mm -hmm. we were, you know, 10,000 years ago, let alone 100,000 years ago. It, yeah. If one of the prevailing theories is migration over boat and island hopping and using the, the currents within the Pacific Ocean, um, mm -hmm. how, how would that explain, at least in your view, findings in Western North America of artifacts mm -hmm. possibly dating to 130,000 years ago when yeah according to your theory there may not have been migration to that part of the world at that point uh no I, i'm not surprised by there being migrations to that part of the world again if we go back to homo erectus at uh, 1.8 million years ago right you know if homo erectus has managed to get all the way in it he's gone to spain he's gone all the way down to indonesia like what is really stopping that that species moving away into america for a start like i mean okay we haven't found huge amounts of evidence but they have found fragments of what appeared to be homo erectus skulls down in in mexico um so i mean there's a good possibility in my mind that homo erectus continued to spread and spread into the americas going back who knows how early to be honest i mean it may have got there you know a million years ago there's no real reason why not and then after that there's also been you know, finds, as you say, you know, this finds later on, we have the one, I think, Vasis, Vasisquillo or something in Mexico, the controversial site there where 
they did they found evidence that humans had been at the site about 200,000 years ago um and the archaeologists just wouldn't accept it careers were ruined <laughs> it destroyed people's careers because you know you can't have people here at that time and the geologists were saying well look you know we've done the science and the samples you've given us suggest they're there 200 300,000 years ago and the archaeologists who are not scientists quite frankly, you know, geology, like, geology is a real science. For anyone out there who doesn't quite understand the difference, you know, geologists go to their lab, right? They run the tests on the stones so that they can see you know, when, when they formed, they can see, you know, when uh, sunlight was last exposed. You know, they do real hard science, okay? So if a geologist is telling you something, I think you should listen to him. If an archaeologist starts telling, well, I'm theorizing that based on the, the information I have and in conjecture with something, look, that's not science. That's like what I do. Yeah, I can look at information and I can tell you what I think it means. And I do that. And I don't have a degree, right? That's the difference between me and an archaeologist. It's, it's not typically that, that the archaeologist is a hard scientist, right? Because these are like social sciences. Mm -hmm. So really, the geologists, in my mind, were accurate. And the site was probably 200,000 years old. And it's just been you know, buried. And now they just don't talk about it. So th they, they've known for a long time that there was evidence of early humans in the Americas going back like at least sort of 200,000 years. And as I say, they've had fragments of, of Homo erectus skulls down in Mexico. And skulls that have Homo erectus features down as far as like Ecuador and other parts of South America. So I think there's an untold story there of a much earlier you know, waves of colonization of the Americas. Um, and that will eventually come out. Obviously, this 130,000 year old find, you know, is starting to push that boundary. But I think at some point someone's got to say, well, what about that? That, you know, I think it was uh, McIntyre, you know, and her work. You know, what about her work? What about, you know, the evidence in, in Vastus Kilo that we had? This? You know, that's got to come back at some point because I think it's nuts that, that that has just been swept under the carpet, especially now that we're finding these other sites that would validate it. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I totally concur with, you know, with that view that there, there likely was earlier waves. And also in terms of the Bering Straits thing, you know, it was always a kind of a stupid theory because, like, let's be honest, again, applying common sense, like, you know, those parents and stuff, are you going to, like, take your family and just walk out into the ice for no freaking reason at all, isn't it? Like, ah, you know, over there, maybe there's something beyond the ice. You know, like, ice kills you. You know, typically you avoid the ice. I mean, unless you're very specialised, you know, say we have the Inuits and stuff, who have, over time they've specialised. If you're migrating and you're moving up from, say, Asia, and it's been pretty cool, it's pretty nice in Asia, you know, it was warm, you know, and you get to this ice, and you're just like, what is your driver to just walk out into the ice? You know, it's it's not logical and it's not reasonable. And I think at the beginning of that theory, they should have said, well, look, you know, um, is this at all sensible? And they would have looked at each other and said, like, no, 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 no freaking way, man. Nobody would do well, that. You, and now we know they didn't do that. Well, you look at it this way. Like, <laughs> they, you're, you're a dad. Have you ever gone on a trip and, like, not even bothered to open up your GPS and you said, ah, sh like, fuck it, I know the way there. It's okay. We'll find it. Just, like, let, let's head west and we're good. Like, yeah, the sun, people, you know, yeah. the moon's up there. Oh, I could find direction. And, you know, like, all of a sudden you go to this Some people did it, but I think it's so flow. hard to go across, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, now we know that people have boats. I mean, that's the bottom line to what I'm getting at is that, look, we know that ancient humans had boats and, like, they sailed across because cause, cause that's not that hard. When you sail along next to the ice and you stop and you kill the odd, you know, walrus or bear or whatever it is you see, you know what I mean, and you fish and you, survive, you drink the water from mounting ice, suddenly you have a viable route into the Americas, right? Uh, and now they're starting to accept it, and they're talking about these, um, these what's it, I call the core now, the corridor, following these little islands and stuff across. So they're starting to realize. And again, we know that there was evidence of some kind of ability to move across water going back for hundreds of thousands of years, because we've got, we've got these hominins now in Flores, down in Indonesia, right, who are on who have reached Flores a million years ago. And you have to make like multiple sea crossings to get there. So even if you somehow floated accidentally, I mean, you still have crossed a significant body of water and survived. So we know that sea routes are more viable than ice routes, right? So when we reassess, and we've also noticed that actually down in the Mediterranean, there's islands there with tools on them that can only be reached, again, by multiple <clears throat> journeys at sea. And these go back a couple hundred thousand years. Um, there's another one down at Socotra off the Horn of Africa. They think it's perhaps 500,000 years old to a million years old, the site there, multiple stone tools. And Socotra is like well out into the sea. 
I mean, it's like, I think it's like 100 miles or something out into the sea. So you're not floating on a log to Socotra. You know, so somebody has managed to somehow put together something that carried a few people. So again, we tend to like, rethink the entire map of hominid migrations because once you factor in boats, instead of just putting little arrows, you know, oh, they had to go all the way up here on the map and they have to go all the way over. No, they got their boat and they just sailed across. You know, it, it's completely different. Because when you look at, say, the tip of like the south of Spain and you look at Morocco, for example, pretty damn close by sea. But if you're walking, it's an enormous distance, isn't it? I mean, to walk from the south of Spain all the way around, you know, through Europe, down, you know, into the Middle East and into Africa. But if you just sail across to, to Morocco or from Morocco to Spain, that's like, you know, a few hours at sea. So I think there's a lot of rethinking that has to be done in some of these models because I'm really suspicious that when you see, say, important sites in Morocco and important sites in the south of Spain, and we're talking about these vast migrations, and I'm looking at that little tiny stretch of water, and I'm telling you, I think that, you know, in most of those cases, we're going to find that the people just sailed across. And the same at the Bab el Mandab and stuff, that you can see that it splits off to mid to, between the Middle East and East Africa, a very short body of water that you can just sail across on a simple raft, you know, like a you know, bamboo raft or something will do it. So, I mean, this changes the way that we think about these migrations, because for a long time, we've always, you know, looked at how vast the world is. But as we know today, you know, it, it's much smaller if you can sail. Well, even walking, well, this is also directly over the, the Strait of Gibraltar. If you want to go to Morocco to Spain now, uh, it's about 244 mm -hmm. hours, or about 12,000 kilometers, or 1,200 kilometers, mm -hmm. rather. It's it's the 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 joke um, of why did it mm -hmm. take uh, you know Moses forty forty years to get from uh, Egypt to uh, Israel where it's like mm -hmm. only like six days walking time between the two places. <laughs> it's like <laughs> true, yeah. It's a long time to take. So it's a wavy route. Yeah, well, yeah, like you know, it's it, again, it, it's the whole. Well, the sun's up in the sky. We don't have a map. Yeah, we'll just walk around. It's like, <laughs> yeah. is that the same rock we've gone by three times already? No, no, I'm, I'm telling you, we're going the right place. Um, what about the so some of the more uh, I'm going to say contentious finds, uh, mm -hmm. such as the uh, Paluxy River findings of dinosaur. Uh, footprints mixed with uh, supposed human footprints. Some people have said that they are human. Some people have said that they are uh, just three-toed uh, dinosaur mm -hmm. feet that have been kind of washed away by time. Although it is mm -hmm. fairly convincing looking at some of these footprints, which are side by side with apparent dinosaur footprints, mm -hmm. that they look fairly hominid. Yeah, I mean, they, they sort of look very hominid. But again, I, you know, when I, when I look at this, I, I have to sort of go with the guy that is an expert in it, you know, because if the, the paleontologists and geologists look at it, and if they say, look, you know, we can match this with an eroded dinosaur footprint, it's very hard for me as a lay person then to argue that. You know what I mean? I can, I can say that, yeah, it looks kind of to me like, human foot. but one of the things about that is right, it looks kind of me like a footprint with a shoe on, right? And that to me is kind of problematic because because what we'd expect to see is like five toes, you know, that. And what we tend to see at these sites is, is it looks more like a shoe print of a person. And that, that to me makes it a bit suspicious because, I mean, it's like, well, that looks more like a, an eroded dinosaur print because of the fact we don't have a bare foot with five toes where we could say, well, that's a human footprint. You know what I mean? Because when we see those like elsewhere, we know that, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but, but certainly, you know, there are human footprints, you know, like the one, sorry, down in um, Crete, wherever it's like, that they found recently, you know, there's like five million year old whatever footprints of a hominin, you know? Mm. But the reason why it's identified as a hominin is because they, they've managed to match the toe marks, you know, and they can see that this is a human print. Uh, uh, but when you've got just the sort of, the, that shape of like a human shoe, you know, it makes it really difficult, you know, because then you say, well, then you have to factor in that they must have had shoes. And then you're sort of having to build a case with evidence you haven't got to support it, you know what I mean? So. So it makes it really, every time I've looked at like out of place objects and I've looked where I've looked carefully, because I used to believe in pretty much all of them, you know, the hammer in the stone, Looking you know, right the, now, the prince next to dinosaur, yeah. all of, and when I look at the stories carefully, I've debunked all of them that I've looked at, right? So Ooh, I'm not convinced, but at the same time, I'm open-minded that we may have had a human-like ancestor alive in those times, but I just, I haven't seen good evidence for it. Okay, well, let, let's let's talk about those for a second because I, I'm a big uh, a fan of mm. parts, uh, just because you know again there mm. some of them are interesting. Obviously, uh, some are mm. a little out there. Uh, you know, interesting being. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember what it was. The uh, was one of 
I believe it was actually... It was the mechanism that was found in the Mediterranean that may have been made by Archimedes, uh, which was essentially used as a, as a um, navigation device. Uh, mm-hmm. Very, very advanced. Like that, you know, that, that could be traced to a couple, th- like 2,000 years ago or, or mm-hmm. you know, 2,500 years ago. It's, you know, they had, they had machinery then. Um, even in, in Egypt uh, during ancient times, uh, during the Roman Empire, mm-hmm. you know, a, a lot of the temples had uh, mechanized uh, statues like the gods would move because they were on like a pulley system of some kind. So they, they, they yeah. these types of mechanisms have been around, but mm-hmm. we, we get to things like, uh, I'm trying to see a good one here. Well, you know, mm-hmm. let's talk about the hammer, uh, <laughs> stuck in the stone, which is mm-hmm. one that everyone knows. I'm just going to bring that up here on screen. Cause I can do that. Yeah. So that's, that's the hammer on, on stone. W- what exactly, uh, I, I should say, Considering that people have said that it was found within a strata of rock that was maybe hundreds of millions of years old, how did you go about debunking it? Well, well, well that yeah, I looked at the argument, and what I found is the geologists were saying that actually, firstly, that it wasn't attached to any strata. So, so first, you couldn't say it was part of that strata that was nearby. That was the first point. Mm-hmm. Secondly, said actually, the date for the strata is wildly wrong, that as it's given online. They said the dates are completely different. Uh, and the next point they said is that we know that accretions like this can form, you know, fairly fast. And, and, I, and I, you think about it. I, one thing I, I tell you, I, I remember when I was working in construction for a while and I remember we had to like take out a boiler and that, you know, we, and you smash out the boiler and you have rocks inside, right, in your boiler. Right? And if you found those stones just lying on the floor, it looks like a stone, you know, you have these accretions and they can form very fast when you have a lot of calcium or a lot of uh, partic- particulate stone matter in water it accretes and forms a concrete right and these these concretes can form relatively fast especially in geological time spans but you know over over decades or centuries you know so unless it had been actually attached to the main body of stone there there's no way to say it was part of that older stone right and the other problem is it, it's found by just a couple of passers-by right who have no scientific knowledge at all of how geology you know works you know how creations form so no scientists were brought to have a look you know and identify on site you know it's an object which is then adopted by the christian scientists right by these by basically fundamentalists and the only scientists really there you go and look at who these people are that they're, they're arguing the science they are fundamentalists with fake degrees from these christian universities right telling us geology people who will tell you that the earth six thousand years old they're telling you the geology behind the formation of that of that accretion so it, you know it starts to just crumble apart in your hands as if it, you know instead of being accretion it was just sand because you know that was the problem and you know at first it sounds really good because again it's like the out of africa if i say to you first well well seventy thousand years ago people walked out of africa and then i start explaining other stuff right so if i say to you well this hammer was part of this this older stone mm-hmm. and then it was this and this and this because at the first bit you've bought my first bit of the lie where i say it was part of that stone and i offer you no proof whatsoever that that was ever joined to that older bit of stone. And, and then I roll from there with whatever I want to say. And that's the problem with a lot of these parts is that the beginning bits, is, so when it was attacked, or when it was this, and then you look at it and you find there's no evidence for that opening statement. And that, yeah, everything after that would be believable if that opening statement was true, but there's no evidence for it. Uh, one of the ones that always surprised me um, was the, what I call the, the space potato. It's the... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know the, the the potato that looks to have an electrical plug in it, which was found by William. Uh, I can't mm-hmm. even pronounce his last name. It, uh, on on the show, if I mispronounce a name, everyone has to take a shot. So I, I don't want to get. Yeah. Uh, if if I start mm-hmm. with this, they'll, people will be drinking all night. Uh, yeah. You know, like it, to me, it seems that it's just a rock that somebody stuck a plug into. And I can tell yeah, outright, yeah. it's like, there's nothing yeah. else. Let, let's crack it open. No, I don't think anyone's ever cracked it open to see what's inside of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure that if you did that, yeah. you know, you just say, yeah, it's nothing. Yeah. It's, it's uh, so. And it, like the microchip in stone and then you look at it and you think, well, it looks quite like a leaf pattern fossilized into stone. People are like, it's a microchip. It's a microchip. You know, it's like, mm, well, I don't know. I've seen those kind of patterns on leaves, you know, it's stuff like that where, you know, these assertions have just come up front. But then if you took it to a, like a geologist or a paleontologist and said, mm. like, please, can you like give an independent evaluation of this? And most of the people don't want to do that. And the reason why they don't want to do that is because they know the story will crumble apart. 
Uh, instead, you know, they have something special. Isn't it? You know, I've got this special object. But, you know, we, they sort of know if a scientist came along and looked at it, uh, gave an independent evaluation, he's probably going to turn and say, well, it's, you know, I'm sorry, sir, but this is just a common, you know, fossil. Or, and, and this is where, I, you know, I've, I think I've become more skeptical because I've realized that until you have a geologist or a scientist or someone look at these, all we have in it is usually like a layman's opinion and the layman doesn't really know geology. Like, I don't really, I didn't study geology, uh, uh, you know, so I've had to admit that I don't have the ability to assess these objects. And, and unless somebody who does looks at them, we should be really skeptical when we see a headline saying 20 million year old, you know, object or 10 million year old footprint, because the only person who can give you that information is a geologist. Right. Nobody else. Like, I'm sorry, but a, a Christian who just believes it, that's no matter how strong his belief is, that doesn't make it so, you know, and that we, we do actually need people to say, well, look, take these objects to an in, independent review. And in fact, the, the stone in the hammer, the scientists repeatedly asked, could I just like, you know, look at it? And because like, I'm telling you, I don't <laughs> think it is. I think it's this and this. And after like years of him trying to get the guy to bring it, he never did because he knew if he took it to him, that his whole you know, famous hammer thing, which just the case would collapse. And I think that shows the kind of dishonesty in some of these things is that if you really like if you and I believed we had that object, we wouldn't have a problem taking it to the scientists and saying, well, what is your opinion, mate? Because I want to know if this is real. And instead, the people hide them in their house and just charge tickets for you to come and have a look and stuff like that. So, you know, that's <laughs> it's kind of suspicious. You know, what are some out of a uh, place artifacts that you think are a little more unexplainable or may have a little more credence to them that are actually, uh, you know, that at first glance, most people wouldn't consider? Are, are there any that lend to that? Or do you think they're all, you know, pretty much you, you've debunked them all. You think they're all kind of hokey and it's, I would, you know, there, there's always one at least that I think that most people tend to not be able to explain. Um, I'm... Yeah, you know, mm. I I can't think of one off the top of my head. The um... well, there's well, look, there's a it's not an object I can show you, but I mean, it, I've got a book here. I've forgotten the, uh, what's the name somewhere here. Uh, anyway, it's a book, like a, a Tibetan Buddhist book, right? There's this guy. He's a kind of a, he's a revered teacher. The book's not about like Upads or anything. Obviously, it's about his life and about philosophy and stuff. But in it, he talks about an account where. He's one of his uncles who's considered like a, you know, a high revered meditation mm -hmm. master in Tibet. And um, he has this prophetic dream that he's going to that he's going to find like either a hidden text or a hidden object. And this is something in Tibetan tradition is well known that every now and again, a meditation master suddenly knows where an ancient text or something is hidden uh, and they'll go along and they will reveal it. You know, because they know oh, in the past, a lot of these things have been hidden. Objects have been deliberately hidden. Texts are deliberately hidden and that people in a high meditative state and in altered states of consciousness, they, they suddenly see the locations, right? And so he gets this this feeling that, you know, that there's this object. And so he talks to this, the, the author of the book, who's just like, you know, his nephew, and he says, look, you know, what should I do? You know, should we just, like, privately go and collect it and see what it is? And the guy says, well, no, look, if we bring a load of people along, it's a validation for them of something special and that, you know, it will help increase their their conviction in, our, in the teachings of, you know, Buddhism and stuff. So... So he says, yeah, all right then. So they like gather a whole big group of people. And remember, the book's not about this. So he's not doing this as some sort of claim to get Upart's people involved or anything. You know, this is something in an obscure book that most people probably, unless you're into Tibetan Buddhism, would never read. Mm. And so he takes along this group and they go off into the mountains. And he says, look, it's up there, you know, up in that where you can just see a cliff face. He says, that's where I saw where the object is. And he takes like a pick, like a little ice axe and he throws it. And they said it sticks into the wall. So, like, obviously it shouldn't stick into the wall. So they get a guy up on a ladder and he goes up there and he pulls it away. And this wall just crumbles away and it's clearly artificial. And, um, and basically they extract from the hole what he describes as a, a, a melon-sized white orb glowing with light, right, which they bring down from, so they bring down in a cloth. The guy says, don't touch it. So they roll it with the axe into a cloth and carry it down. So whatever it is, he says, it's not safe to touch it. It's some, you know, obviously it's something odd and special. Uh, they bring it down. He says, well, I'm going to put it away for now until, it, until it's the right time to, to do something with it. He said, puts it in a locked box. You know, they seal it, wax seals, everything. Put it away to keep it safely. And a few months later when they go to open it, it's vanished without any sign of the seals being broken. And he says, oh, the, 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 the Dakinis have taken it away again. 
So, I mean, make of that what you will, but I think these things are out there. I do think there are strange objects hidden away, probably from either a long lost civilization or from space visitors, whoever. I think they exist, but I think that, you know, they are infrequently found. And, and the ones that we know of are poorly evidenced, or like these ones where I can't go and see that. But it sounds like, you know, I don't know why else he'd have mentioned it. It's one of those stories you think, well, why mention it? Unless you wanted to just make yourself sound strange in a book that's not about that at all. Just as a story he remembers from when he was younger seeing this object. So those type of things do make me think, well, hmm, you know, I can't see why the guy would have just made that up. Because if anything, it's hurting the rest of his argument that he's teaching you stuff to say, well, maybe he's just nuts. You know, so those kind of stories, you know, I guess it's like with the abductee accounts, isn't it? That you wonder, well, well, why does a pilot or someone say, you know, I was attacked by aliens when you know all it's going to do is cause him problems? You know, there's certain stories like that, which I'd say, well, yeah, I'm willing to sort of say that that sounds kind of believable. I mean, I don't know what the object was. I don't know where it came from. But it obviously it shouldn't be sealed into a mountain face in Tibet. And, you know, it sounds really odd. So I'm open minded about it. You know, but I haven't seen what I can say is a clear case of an object that someone's got right now that is definitely, you know, from a lost civilization or from space. But, yeah, I suspect that they are out there. What do you think of uh, uh, tales of lost civilizations such as, uh, well, Atlantis, there is some credence to at least the possibility of a landmass existing mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of the Atlantic. I've discussed it on the show a couple of times. I know Randall Carlson, mm -hmm. he's kind of kind of the originator of the theory, uh, which um, and, and I, know, I know Graham has talked uh, about it at length with uh, Randall on uh, Joe Rogan experience um, on one of the two or three episodes that they were on together. Mm -hmm. One that has recently been uh, discussed is Moo, which um, I've looked into, but considering there's only one real source of information, which yeah. is James Churchward's account, uh, which came out, mm -hmm. um, I think it was like the, uh, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, like, do, do you think that it's a possibility, or at least there is some explanation within the geological record, no, the, the genealogical mm -hmm. record of there being some type of mid-pacific polynesian style of larger island due to that may have existed mm -hmm. due to low low sea levels do you think do you think that is possible or is there anything within your research that has yeah brought that forward uh well i i tend to think look, I mean, there's two two possibilities in my mind but the, the one which is the, the most evidenced is that we have the massive sea level rises you know, which not only happened 12,000 years ago, but obviously, you know, intermittently we have huge sea level rises, huge sea level drops, you know. So and we know that lands are flooded, you know, massive amounts of land, particularly in the case of Southeast Asia, where we have, you know, enormous land mass that was taken by the sea around um, Southeast Asia and Indonesia and all, all the coastlines of Australia, you know, totaling the mass of like, you know, a small continent, if you like, you know, so, you know, a vast amount of land went to the sea. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of the legends of, say, a lost continent, to me, are likely about this Sahul, Sunda, you know, shelves being, you know, swallowed by the sea. Certainly the stories of, say, like Atlantis uh, and that period, I think that they obviously relate to this sea level rises. That would be my, I suppose, my most um, scientific based argument was that, yeah, it's probably that. But from, a, from another perspective, the only other way you can explain it, you know, if there was a sunken land is, is some sort of axial pole shift, you know, and that's if there really was a crust displacement, you know, which is obviously at the moment the geologists say that we just don't think they happen. Um, I'm on the fence with that. I think they probably do happen. I think they have probably happened. You know, I, I, I can't make you a, a, a conclusive argument. I read a very good explanation on Graham Hancock's website by an Italian uh, researcher who says that, look, if a comet impacted in just the right speed, just the right angle, and it has to be about, I think about a, a kilometre across, he thinks that it could just for a moment alter the, the, the rotation of the Earth. It, it's through the centrifugal forces, basically, that it starts to form a new equator. But it has to be at just the right point, you know, just the right way. And so that even a fairly small comet could conceivably cause a new equator to begin to form, first with water moving, because obviously water is very fluid, so you start to have a buildup of water in a new place, then that itself affects the, the shape of the crust because mm -hmm. the weight of the water changes. So you get crustal displacement beginning, you know, there's rippling of the crust. Uh, and then the magma, of course, which is liquid, can also move, being fluid, and that you can then have a, a kind of a runaway scenario where more and more mass builds up at this new equator. 
and, and then obviously once that happens, it's like, you know, it, it happens faster and faster until you have like a total shift and a new equator begins to form. Uh, and it, in that kind of event, which would be cataclysmic, then, yeah, you know, land masses could go under the sea um, and, you know, oceans would sweep over lands and, you know, you'd have this really cataclysmic scenario. And like anyone who's looked at, you know, ancient mysteries and alternative research like you can't help but encounter stories of what sounds like that happening and like you know so we, we basically have to decide do we trust our ancestors do we think that they were all bullshitting us because you know that's what it comes to we don't have the science to say it happened or it didn't happen you know we can say well we don't have strong case scientifically but if we trust our ancestors we'd have to say it certainly sounds like it happened because these people have talked about, you know, the sea swept in over the land and, you know, people only survived at the top of a tall tree or in a boat or on a mountain. And that story is everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, a couple of guys or a couple of you know, man or woman, whatever, they survive in a boat or on a mountain or on a tall tree. And, you know, that story is coming from somewhere and from something, you know. So I the benefit of that i think it, i'm trying to st i try to stick with the strongest scientific case and the strongest scientific case is these sea level rises um that would have you know swallowed vast areas of land you know but i'm open minded about that because you know there's a there's a bit of me that thinks hmm these just sound so cataclysmic these stories you know yeah, it, it's these stories of like uh like oh this this uh you know uh spirit uh, or like nature spirit came by and said holy fuck the water's coming get your shit mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially mm -hmm. and yeah. you know it, it's the same the same story whether you're dealing with North American uh, indigenous groups or you're dealing with uh, you know is Israelis from from the mm -hmm. you know uh, from from the Levant it's the, the same the, the same basic story of, of being warned that there's there's a cataclysm coming and then there are the same stories mm -hmm. afterwards of the rebuilding which has yep. been seen in all in South America, in in uh, in, in Egypt, even. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say like yeah, you have to listen to the to, to, to at least listen to it because if you're starting to see yeah. a pattern, it start stops becoming a um, stops becoming a story and starts becoming more of a global theme. If you're hearing mm -hmm. the same thing over and over and over again, and it's all relating to the same time period, and the fact that we haven't looked at it as seriously as a society is kind of troubling to me. And mm -hmm. this is one thing that at least I'm, I'm yeah. glad that we have uh, individuals and authors such as yourself to try and, and bring this forward. Uh, one thing yeah. we have discussed on the show, and I know that uh, Denver would, uh, is one of those individuals who'd be like, dude, you, you got a chance, chance to talk about this love on air and you didn't, um, is giants. And mm -hmm. you, you and I have talked about it uh, on, off air before. And th this is a line of, of um, humans, which there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about it is a global phenomenon mm -hmm. in terms of the legends that are surrounding it. Um, obviously, with when it comes to anything out of you know, the last 200 years, mm -hmm. you can either have things that are very credible because they're photographs, or they can sometimes lead mm -hmm. on the other edge of the coin where or that um, you know it, that would mean that it's very easily fakeable and yeah. but believable at the same time. So, yeah. what? In, in terms of the giant theory, is this something that is credible? Or what, what have you, well, first of all, like, what mm -hmm. have you looked and, and read into it? Yeah. Well, look, the, the first thing I'd say, you know, from, from my sort of perspective is that um, if you look at the fossil record, you look at the African fossil record, mm -hmm. for example, um, down in South Africa around about 300,000 years ago, they there, there was a group of um, what they call Homo heidelbergensis, right, which obviously is a, a, now is considered to be sort of, ancestral neanderthals but you know they're, they're a human species uh, and amongst these groups down there there were routinely you know skeletons around about seven foot tall uh, and also they found a lake bed you know in south africa which contains tools which are just enormous compared to you know, those axe heads in there which are normal size and these other stone axe heads whatever they are just enormous again which seem to associate with this population right so so we know from like a human evolutionary point of view that you can have a splinter population that goes through gigantism and like, you know, and types of gigantism happen on islands and stuff, you know, where, where isolated populations for one reason or another go through a period of gigantism. So, so there's not really like an evolutionary scientific argument to say, well, this can't happen, you know, because, well, it does happen. It has happened. And on top of that, then we have like pygmy people, you know, pygmy people are real. They, they're still there. You know, significant populations of people who are 
unusually short, very small, you know, in their dimensions, but physically formed, you know, perfectly well, um, have smaller brains. They're smaller heads, but they have smaller brains, but they go about their lives perfectly well. You know, they're not mentally retarded or something, you know, so we, we can function uh, at large sizes, we can function at small sizes and in the middle. So the first thing is to say that there's, there's no real argument to say this is a stupid theory because we know it happens. But what, what, you know, what degree of the stories we hear are true and what aren't, you know, obviously then it's, so it's sort of wheating the, you know, sorting the wheat from the chaff, isn't it? Because, I mean, you know, I think that a population of people around maybe seven to eight, nine foot even maybe you know is probably reasonable i think with some of the taller examples when you hear them i you know obviously i keep a, i guess the taller the giant is the more my skepticism will build up you know because obviously if, if someone says to me well look you know there was like a 10 meter tall guy living there you know i'm thinking well that's like jack and the beanstalk now you know where i, I like I'm, I'm struggling to stay on board <laughs> you know but but when someone sort of says you know you've got a a guy that's between, I guess, six and 12 foot, somewhere in that range, like, I wouldn't totally write it off. I mean, I'd say maybe, you know, at the higher end, certainly at the, yeah, the eight foot, nine foot. I mean, even today we have people with, with medical conditions, you know, that, that grow up to around, you know, eight, nine foot. We, we know this stuff happens. Again, we know it does happen. So the idea that it's ridiculous, you know, I don't think is at all fair. And I, I think that with all the accounts and legends that people encountered, groups that were very tall on average you know that we we should take that kind of seriously and understand that you know humans can have you know mutations that lead to a, a new forms and that you know for one reason or another so i mean i tend to think that yeah that there were populations like that and we hear those stories all around the again all around the, like the flood stories again we hear these stories from cultures all around the world and, you know, these cultures are supposedly not directly linked and the stories are supposedly not from the same source. So why is it that the stories are so similar? And even with some of the stories, there there are stories like the, the same story seems to be coming up. Uh, as I mentioned in, in South America, there are stories of, you know, nine foot tall mm -hmm. giants with red hair who just show up on the shore one day and just start mm -hmm. wrecking shit. Uh, the same yeah. thing is, is heard all in, in North America from mm -hmm. the Ohio Valley down to Arizona. Um, not much, yeah. in, uh, you know, above the uh, American Canadian border because, well, obviously around the time that they start, first started appearing, that's when you had a giant ice ice sheet sitting on top of it. So not a lot's going to be happening mm -hmm. there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from anything from biblical uh, stories to mm -hmm. uh, the epics of Gilgamesh, um, yeah. you know, the, the same, the, I, I can't think of any uh, out of uh, Southeast Asia, but I'm, I'm sure that there are stories that are yeah. there. And, yeah. you know, I'm not sure if you've seen the photo, uh, I think it's in Africa, of the, the giant footprint. I've, I've seen most, yeah, most of the pictures of, of giant footprints. I mean, I... Again, I, I'm more skeptical of those for a couple of reasons, because um, the first thing is we'd, we'd have to have a geologist work out, you know, is this, you know, carved or is it formed? You know, that's one thing to start with. Mm -hmm. Then does it match up to the dimensions of a foot, even if it's an enlarged foot? So like an anatomist or someone who can say, well, look, the proportions of the heel to the toes, etc., you know, that this matches up to a foot um and it couldn't be natural weathering and you know so i mean i've become quite skeptical you know in the last few years for someone who was i used to be very very open-minded you know if you said i you know i saw an and i saw a giant I'd probably be like yeah I, I believe you know but now I, I think well is there supporting evidence you know have you brought in the sciences one of the problems i have in the there's a the south african one which michael tellinger kind mm -hmm. of has made famous is that that it's in you know that it's actually in granite or something right and granite forms underground you know in in like amazingly hot conditions right you know where i just i can't fathom how a footprint can be left in a material that forms deep underground at ultra high temperatures because like you know this is just that logically how did something make a print underground at you know thousands of degrees and you know so i do have a problem with some of these because when you look at the geology and they say well look you know we, you know, we know this is granite we know that this is this is not sandstone or something where you could say, okay, someone's walking along a beach, you know, and uh, it solidifies, and you say, okay, we've got a giant footprint here, you know, I, I'd be quite convincing, but if it's, you know, a rock that forms underground at high temperature, I, 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 
struggle to see how a print can be left. It's more reasonable to me is that somebody carved the shape and says that, you know, like maybe they believed in giants. Mm. So they carve a giant's footprint in a wall to sort of say, you know, we believed in giants. This is what a giant's footprint looked like, you know, or something like that. So I think, again, we have to be careful of um, jumping to what seems obvious because it, the obvious thing is someone steps in the stone and makes the print. But I could go and hire someone today you know, and go engrave me a giant's footprint. And I take some photos. And if I put that on my website and I say I found a giant's footprint, 90 percent of the community will take it on faith that, that I'm telling the truth because I generally am telling the truth about things. So I can use that capital to spin a bullshit story. And that will be on most of the blogs and, and web magazines by tomorrow. Bruce has found a massive giant footprint, but I've just paid some guy to engrave it. <laughs> and I, so let, unless a geologist or a scientist or someone comes along and evaluates that, we don't know that people aren't just spinning us bullshit. I just, but think of the speaking tour. You know, there, there's, there's cruises and stuff you can host. Come on. I like, can make up, yeah, I can, cruise. Honestly, if I'd wanted to be famous years ago, I, there's all sorts of bullshit I could have spun out there. There's a lot of people spinning bullshit out there and they're very doing very well for themselves. They're doing all sorts of tours and, and boat, you know, boat trips and, you know, and they're making good money and they're on all the TV shows. But, you know, if you stick with the truth, you know, you don't tell quite, you know, it's not the story's not quite as exciting because, yeah, there's some really exciting stuff. But you have to do it in a logical progression of like you say, well, OK, I'm going to evaluate this site. I'm going to see, you know, what is the evidence for it? What is the argument? You know, who was involved in the discovery? Did they have an agenda? Uh, you know, what did they get out of it? You know, that kind of stuff. And unless we do that background check, we generally, you know, we are putting ourselves vulnerable, basically, um, because and often we will take other researchers on faith. And that's you know, if I know someone and I think that they're, they're a truth teller, even I, you know, I, I would probably take them on faith. And that, that's probably a mistake because they are often taking someone else's thing on faith as well. And you find that you're actually believing something from somebody you would never trust in your wildest dreams because it's come through someone you do trust, you know, and, and we end up with these kind of problems where, you know, so unless we then go and do our own independent checking, you know, that we are really, we are all guilty and we've all been guilty probably at some point of, of, of re retweeting or, or repeating something that at the base of it, there's nothing, there's nothing to the story. And that's kind of like where I'm at with some of these giant footprints. I, there's another one in China. I don't know that Chinese guy didn't just go yesterday, you know, with his friend and say, hey, you know what? People are into giants now. Just carve me out a giant footprint like that one in Africa and like I'll be in all the news. And like he was in all the news because he found a giant footprint. And I've not seen any validation that that was an ancient footprint. Uh, if it's an artifact that's coming out of China, I, I it, again, this is nothing against Chinese history or the Chinese culture or or the, the, the peoples who live there. Um, mm -hmm. But it is known as a place where, uh, let's see... Yep. <laughs> Uh, you, a lot you of hoaxy get, stuff. There's a lot of hoaxy stuff that comes out of there, you know, in terms of just even just regular things. Like you can, there, there are full mm -hmm. big box stores. Like where I live in Ottawa in, in Canada has one of the mm -hmm. largest Ikea stores in North America, I think. It like it, the, the story is you could see it from space and like you can actually see the, the Ikea sign from like 30 mm -hmm. kilometers away. It's that big. And you can mm -hmm. find stores as big in China that look exactly like Ikea, have all Ikea furniture. It's 100% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. fake. Same thing yeah. with, so, you know, there is mm -hmm. a, like, how... Like a replication. There, there's, and, yeah. you know, like, how, how do you know that that isn't, uh, you know, isn't the case? And it, I, I know that it's a false equivalency because you're, you're dealing with, uh, you know, standard mass-produced product for sale for profit versus uh, an artifact which could potentially be thousands well, of years old. Well, also, there's like, accusations of, you know, agendas in Chinese archaeology and all sorts of stuff as well that, you know, I know that within Western archaeology, there's a lot of people who... who are dubious about some of the Chinese archaeology that it's got national interests and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, we, we do have to be sort of skeptical sometimes when regimes are involved in places that, you know, is there an agenda that's being promoted for some reason? You know, there's all sorts of factors that we have to consider, you know, any time that something is found, you know, you know, what is it that they're trying to tell us? But, I, I, you know, the best evidence for me of the giants and stuff, you know, I guess, yes, yeah, when you find, say, you know, the mounds, you know, in, in America, if someone excavates a mound and they find, you know, a 12 foot, skeleton with oversized grave goods and you know you can kind of reasonably say look the, the guy in that grave was unusually tall and stuff but yeah I, at the moment i haven't seen any footprints which i again which I, I find credible i mean it's not that they're necessarily fake but again we go back to that thing of like i want at this point in my life i've realized what i need is a geologist to tell me is there any science to this because 
you know, again, I can look at something and I can tell people, well, I, you know, I think it's this. But if you really sort of said, well, Bruce, do you understand the formation of that type of stone? I'd be like, nah, no idea, mate. You know, so, so that's that's kind of the problem with all of these kind of stories. Again, this goes with you parts. Again, the same problem that when we trace these stories back, we usually find a lay person who has no understanding of what they're looking at, who got really excited, like I would or you would, if we found something, and, and like they got really excited, but then they've uploaded it or whatever and said, look, I found this, and I think it's this and that and that. And because people want clickbait for their websites, you know, that within a day, every blog and website is repeating it, and like there's no attempt to reach a scientist and say, like, what do you think about this? Because inevitably they say, well, like we know that the stone bluff there is, you know, made of limestone or whatever, you know, and it's this old and, you know, so conceivably it could be or couldn't be. You know, that's what we need for those type of things, you know. Um, and that's why with my book, I mean, you know, as you said earlier, most people that write about the part of history I write about are pretty much making stuff up. You know, so I went to the extreme of of really going through just valid scientific sources and, 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 and accepting that I'm not a geologist, you know, I'm not a geologist. Right? I'm not a, a, an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a molecular chemist. Right? I cannot do those experiments. Right? I cannot mm. go dig up a hominin fossil and uh, analyze it, get extract its DNA. You know, it'd be lying to say that I'm out there in the field, you know, researching human evolution. Because if I was, you should, yeah, you should rightly laugh because you'd sort of think, well, what the fuck is his training to do that? I you know, as excited as it looks with him the running about digging up bones. What the fuck does he know? <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so I think we have to be able to use the science sources. Otherwise, we're always in danger of basically all getting carried away and then carrying each other along with it because then we all get excited. You know, you tell your friends, you tell someone else. And before we know it, it's accepted because other blogs say it's so. And we have a chain of blogs and there's nobody that's actually evaluated it. Now, uh, I'm not going to use the word skepticism uh, because I know it can sometimes have a negative connotation to it. But mm -hmm. where did when did you first start to have your i'm going to say rational uh your rational open-minded moment everyone has it i i think like i i've had mm -hmm. at least two in the last couple of years because i i used yeah. to be like you were where i'd you know mm -hmm. like oh, holy shit they found something in you know like in, in south mm -hmm. africa and oh my god it's like yeah. two hundred thousand years old and my rational mind would go right out the window and yeah. i would just take mm -hmm. it at face value and i wouldn't i wouldn't put any thought into it and somewhere along the line there was uh, you know something that i'm trying to remember the author Ah, uh, I think his name's, I'm probably going to get shit on for this. I think it was actually Gerald Clark, who is an author out of, I think he's out of the States. Um, uh, one of our listeners and, and masters would be able to tell me because mm -hmm. we, we joke about it all the time. And he essentially writes about the Anunnaki um, like it's, you know, it, it's pure science fiction, at least to me. Oh, sorry, I, I should say it sounds to me like it's pure science fiction, mm -hmm. although he's writing it as if it were actually fact. And it's due to an interpretation yeah. that apparently he has based yeah. on the mythology. And I think yeah. it was at that moment that I started to realize maybe that there is um, not as much to the story as some people would claim because, mm -hmm. you know, there people like mm -hmm. to make money. <laughs> that was yeah. kind of my, my yeah. aha yeah. moment. What what was yours like? What what kind of made mm -hmm. you switch over to that? OK, well, there, there needs to be evidence to be able to back up extraordinary claims, and I won't necessarily accept it without it. Mm -hmm. I think there's two things. I think, um, firstly, I, you know, I. I was a co-author in a book which was largely based on unsubstantiated, you know, subjective personal experiences. So, so obviously I experienced some level of clobbering, you know, for that, because then people just say, well, you know, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe you, you know, you're just making it up, you know, this is rubbish or whatever. So, I mean, I've had that as a direct experience, but I also think that, you know, strangely enough, it was working with ayahuasca in South America over a period, and I say I was in Ecuador for five years, I was working with San Pedro and Ayahuasca during that period. And that I think that one of the messages I got from the plant was that, you know, not to be so open-minded. And I know that sounds funny because a lot of people say they go off to South America, you know, people that have been very closed-minded and that the plants and stuff open their minds and say, you know, there's a bigger reality and, you know, you've got to accept more of the, you know, more of the things out there and, and see that there's a bigger cosmos. And that's, you know, quite typical. But I think if you go into it as someone who's already very open-minded, the plant doesn't need to do that at all, and obviously because you're already open-minded to consciousness and aliens and, and all the rest of it. So yeah, conversely, I think that I was actually given the message to be more, be more skeptical, be, be more critical, not so skeptical, but critical of what I was processing and certainly what I would put out there. Because I mean, what I think in the back of my head 
you know, some of it is quite extraordinary and very strange. You know, there's some very weird things that I do believe. Um, you know, so people might get the impression listening to me here. Well, God, you know, he sounds like some sort of academic skeptic asshole, or so, which I can understand. But in the back of my head, there's all kinds of things I believe that I'm not saying because I can't back them up. You know, and that's why I've realized that I have to filter what I share as a kind of a message to the public. Um, and that's not to say that I would turn around and say to someone who says, well, look, do you believe in aliens? Yeah, I believe in aliens. Can you prove them right now? Right now? No. Am I working on it? Yes. You know, um, can you prove those giants? I can't prove it, but I've seen other people with very strong cases that, you know, they've, the mound data and all. So, yeah, I believe that there was some giants around. You know, stuff like that. I, I, my, my opinions are more measured, and uh, I would I would definitely say that that was, yeah, the combination of being clobbered for putting something out there that was really, I, I, I couldn't substantiate my argument with you. If you said, I'm going to pick that book apart, you would probably just annihilate me, you know, on it. Yeah, because I didn't supply hard evidence. It was, you know, subjective stuff. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, it's that combination of, of having got the scars from doing that and being given the message from higher consciousness through ayahuasca that you know, I needed to be careful because some of what I'm working on is very important and I can damage the overall message by putting stuff out there that sounds really weak. Yeah, I'm one of the jokes that that we uh, talk about on the show is uh, like we're, we're still waiting on Nibiru, and I know that uh, uh, McAllis and chat mm-hmm. we have here on YouTube was stating it's like well you know there's one theory that Nibiru is our second star, and I'm I'm saying the person who came up with that theory, it their theory of it being the second star is just as valid as my theory of it being made of cotton candy, you know it's yeah. it's possible, yeah. not very likely, <laughs> but it's mm-hmm. possible. Yeah. And, and we don't know till we see it. And that's you know? yeah, and and that's the prevailing idea of one of these of of most of these alternative theories that okay like anything is possible then there is a lot of scientific evidence to be able to support that there is a planet that is out there. Um, you know, I think it's a 200 AU mm-hmm. that's tugging at, uh, um, you know, that's tugging at the outer uh, outer planets and, and, proto- and uh, yeah. uh, dwarf planets. But, you know, the idea that it's going to come crashing into the inner solar system and, you know, every mm-hmm. 5,000 years is just, it's ludicrous and insane because it would, yeah. you know, you have a planet of that size that would come into the inner solar system. You know what would happen? It would kick all the planets out. You know, yeah. there's there's a lot of rationality that people just kind of kick mm-hmm. out of their minds when it comes to a lot of these and they'll latch on to it and they'll just hold on yeah. to it. And it's it's nice mm-hmm. and it's fun, but mm-hmm. at some point we have to, you know, if we want to be able to find out what, uh, where we came from, that there has to be, yeah. a, you know, an, an actual logical thought process. Yeah, it's got to have evidence, not just, you know, the like ancient aliens as a religion as opposed to ancient aliens as a valid, you know, theory you know there's, there's like this big difference in it you know on the one hand as you sort of touched on there look we have a, a burgeoning industry based around ancient aliens i mean there's like no argument against that we know that there is you know there's conferences there's events there's books there's tv shows and there's a, a growing populace that is die hard believers in certain stories um but that when you get to the root of it you know if you sit me down with the average ancient aliens theorist what will happen is I will annihilate their argument first and then they will do what all true faith believers do. They basically tell you to fuck off and that, you know, you're a skeptic and they don't want to hear what you're saying and they close up like any fundamentalist Christian would if you pull apart the Bible. Because in the end, there isn't the tangible evidence for their argument, right? I know there isn't, like you know there isn't, because if, if there was, you know, then it'd be you know, conclusive or whatever, you know, or at least near to conclusive. And I, I wouldn't be able to argue against them because you'd be like, well, what about that spaceship that we found, you know? Oh, yeah, fuck, yeah, that spaceship you found. Well, yeah, you're right. It's obviously, that's real, isn't it? Or, you know, we found a, a two million year old uh, carbon fiber geodesic dome under the Atlantic. Uh, right, uh, yeah, uh, that must be aliens then, because it can't be. When you have something like that, like everyone else has to shut the fuck up, you know, and believe it. But until you've got like these sort of, you know, really strong like data points, like when, you, when you're going off of stories, like I've got a story based on a story based on a story, like, I'm sorry, but that's like not really hard evidence. You know, it's 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 admissible in the case. You know what I mean? You can say, well, it seems like such and such a culture like had an experience with beings from another world because they say, you know, I don't know, some beings came down, told them some stuff. You know, it was really important, so they've remembered it in their oral tradition or they've written it down. And like, so we can say, you know, well, I, I suspect that they had a valid experience that caused them to believe this. You know. But that's really not the same as saying it's proven because an Egyptian guy once said it, you know, 
Yeah, but I know people from Egypt today that will they'll sell you a line, you know, tell you some bullshit. So you, you can't say just because an ancient Egyptian said it, it must be a fact that aliens came here. You know, these are the kind of problems I think we have within that sphere, isn't it? Is that, you know, we, we have to, we're basing it mostly on stories, not objective physical evidence, not the genetics. You know, typically it's just the stories. And, uh, and the stories aren't really consistent, you know, because we could look at, a story from say the, the native american indians and their accounts of alien visitations and we can contrast that with stories say from from the middle east and stuff where where of the ancient middle east where it sounds quite different the nature of these events and like they can both be valid or they could both be not true you know there's and so we have these kind of problems that like how do you sieve all that through to make a sort of a singular cohesive picture and I, I don't know that you can i think that you really need an evaluation where we we look at objective evidence that supports some of these stories because it is no good. I mean, I, I know that the, the one here, you know, I try and avoid touching a bit because, you know, everyone hates on you if you dare to question, you know, Sitchin stories and stuff. But, you know, obviously that's the most famous, the, the famous books, you know, are Sitchin's books, you know, and we know there are problems in there because for a start, you know, he tells us that rocket ships, uh, specifically rocket ships, flew to Earth with these aliens on board you know, and they did all this stuff, supposedly, I think, 400,000 years ago, right? So the first thing we have there is primitive rocket technology, right? Because we know today rocket technology is shit, right? We, we scraped our ass to the moon and back, right? And that's it. We ain't going to know Alpha Centauri in our rocket ships. You know, we are not going nowhere in those rocket ships. We, we didn't even go back to the fucking moon, right? Because it was so hard. Yeah. Or if you believe we didn't go, whatever. But I can tell you now. We haven't made it to Mars, you know, we haven't made it out to Venus. We are not going out into the universe in rocket ships, right? So then it has to be the planet has to be super close to explain it, you know, and, and then this planet that we can't see, you know, and it still starts like crumbling into this weird story. And then you think, well, they on Earth 400,000 years ago, right? And they stay on Earth for, for hundreds of thousands of years and they fly away in their rocket ships, right? So there's literally no development in their technology in 400,000 years, whereas we have gone from, you know, a wind-up car to our spaceships in like 100 years. Like, so why is it these Anunnaki are totally frozen in time with their shit rocket ships? I mean, there's stuff like that that when you look at it and you think, no, nah, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like a ro you know, rocket ship, you wouldn't venture off into space in your rocket ships. You know, so there's something's not wrong in that account, you know, because in the modern world where we know that there's bad technologies coming in, we know that an advanced civilization is not flying around the universe in rockets, right? You know, they've got, you know, technologies that probably warp the, the, the very fabric of space time, you know, because you can't go anywhere unless you're going at least to close light speed. And I mean, you know, so there, there's all these kind of inconsistencies. And again, that, you know, they can do all this genetic engineering, but they've got technology that's like less than we have today. And so I, I think there's some really strange stuff. In there. And, uh, you know, if you just take it as a translation of someone else's story, then that's more accurate, you know, and then you can say, well, OK, maybe there's something in there somewhere that does relate to an alien visitation. But like that's really not conclusive proof or anywhere near it. And that it's full of these inconsistencies that need to be ironed out, you know. So, I mean, I know you have your thoughts. Everyone obviously is aware of of that but there's if you dare to sort of say those things and people say you're hating on Sitchin and you know he's the truth carrier and stuff he's like well no I, I just like many people I would like the full truth I don't want to just believe someone else's story because we've all grown up believing stories you know whether it's you know biblical stories or or the history you know the history stories and stuff like wanting the truth you know is really wanting the truth not that I just want a, a more exciting story and th that's one of the things that at least I find with with uh, decision is that in the time that he had written the original uh, his original books, the technology, at least to me, after reading it now, and I, you know, I'm I'm tend to think that it's more along the lines of okay, it, it's it reads like science fiction based on technology that was available then to somebody who knew yeah. the technology then. Um, that's right. You know, mm -hmm. at the same time, it's I have to sit there and go like, well, I wasn't alive back then. I don't know for sure. I don't think we like we mm. haven't found any evidence beyond I believe that there are South uh, South African uh, gold mines which are you know really to which which date back you know at least Tellinger states that they're like 120,000 years again if we're dealing also with footprints that may or may not be real then there's also a matter of okay well if this is being said how does it we we can verify the data 
well, what's the mm-hmm. actual proof and evidence? And to be able to find that, you have to actually go there. Yeah. And most people don't have the time or the energy to actually do that. Um, no. What's been mm-hmm. your process in, in terms of research uh, for, like you said, you've been going through a lot of the, um, a lot of the scientific papers that have been released. Have you done any traveling yourself or spoken to any experts? Uh, how, how have you developed and, and put together the, the information? What, what's your process? Uh, particularly for this book, I've been, yeah, like focused on reading through, yeah, you know, published papers, um, you know, the articles in the more, you know, I guess, respected science magazines and stuff. I've had very limited communication with scientists, but more now, really, than during the process. Um, I wanted to be, you know, quite an independent review of it, you know, not to be influenced by one particular scientist that's willing to help me or something, you know, because inevitably then you start taking on their view or feeling a sympathy for their view because, you know, you don't want to then sh- name and shame someone that's been helping you or, or something, you know, so you get put in these awkward positions if you if you look for help sometimes. So particularly if you're looking to criticise a consensus view. So I, I, in that respect, yeah, I did do it all myself. Um, and just using, you know, my own time and my, you know, my own resources to do that. I have travelled and been to a lot of ancient sites. You know, I've been to, I did the Science Channel trip for the Giants thing. You know, into Georgia, I've been, hiked into the Caucasus. Uh, you know, I've been to Mexico. I've been to like, you know, Palenque and a lot of the Mayan sites. Uh, I've been out to Angle Wat. You know, I've, um, as I say, marched into the jungle in Ecuador to go see a site. Um, yeah, and I'm from the UK, so I've been around a lot of the old stone sites, you know, in um, in the UK. So I mean, you know, I'm willing to get my ass out there, but at the same time, I recognise my limitations with the ability to assess. You know, that I, there's things you can notice, like you know, if you're in an ancient site and you've got a sort of critical eye, yeah, you do notice things. You think, hang on, that you know, that's similar to uh, a symbol I've seen, you know, on an Egyptian statue or something. You know, what I mean? so there's things that you can gain by being in those sites, even without being an academic expert. You know, I don't have to go there just to sample, you know, the, the, the stone or something. You know, yes, you know, there is an advantage to doing that. Um, but also, I do recognize those limitations. I do need to be able to read those papers um, if I want to have, you know, a real understanding, you know, of, of, of the subject. So it's, it's definitely a combination. But uh, I'm heavily reliant, certainly for the human evolution side of stuff. Yeah, heavily reliant on the mainstream view because uh, we don't, you know, there's not really anyone outside of that mainstream that can, you know, have, you know, go to a lab and, and do, you know, genetic testing and, and work out when a population diverged or something. So so we kind of have to use that data. You know, I didn't have a choice. Um, but, yeah, I do try and get myself out there to places and see things for myself where I can. You know, I'm not affluent or anything. You know, if I had if, if I had a million dollars in the bank, I probably would have solved a lot of the, the mysteries that are in my mind, you know, by now already. Because once you sort of know where to look and what you're looking for, and if you've got the money in your back pocket... You know, I think a lot of these mysteries would evaporate pretty fast. But I mean, not many of us in this community uh, are fortunate enough to be blessed with, you know, a bank account just like <laughs> overflowing with cash. You know, <laughs> um, so so I can't really do that. Yes, yeah, so I have to be able to sort of make the most of the resources I've got. Mm-hmm. But considering that, you know, I, I recently had one scientist who's, you know, reviewed my book and said, look, you know, considering that you, you have no training in this, he said, it's actually quite astonishing that you've managed to do this, like sitting in your bedroom, basically, on your own, like rewriting human evolution. I mean, considering that, you know, when you think that what I'm against is entire teams of collaborating universities, of some <laughs> of the, what's considered to be the top minds in the world, with access to libraries and new data sciences, and, you know, and that they've spent seven years at least in university specialising, versus me on my own in my bedroom, right, on the internet, you know, with no help. Like, obviously, my book's not perfect. I wouldn't cause I wouldn't expect it to be, you know, in those circumstances. I don't have those resources. But I've come up with an argument where scientists look at it and they say, well, you know what, actually, it's it's a sensible argument. And you, you've put together, you know, reasonable scientific arguments, you know, that, that we can't just sort of say, oh, you know, oh, it's just, you know, another one of these sort of fringe alternative research you know they can't really say that because it's their research you know and i'm referencing them so i think that's why the book is problematic for the consensus is because you know if you like some of the books you thought of you know, earlier on that like you mentioned obviously um, we've got like credo's stuff you know and there's i guess some other people like robert Seffer's stuff and there's there's people writing on these kind of evolutionary origin stories but they tend to include a lot of like really unsubstantiated arguments. I mean, I, like I, the popularity, say, of um, the what's it, the Rh negative stuff. I mean, like, things like that that come up a lot. Mm. And so, but there's 
when you look into those arguments, there is no basis for what they're saying. Like if you look at the science papers, and you, you, which I do, I mean, like I'm an abnormal, I mean, I'm an abnormal person who sits there and like looks through the papers, right? Because like no one else in this, probably most people in this study area, if they're honest, will say, no, I've never read through a paper on, you know, the, the mutations that led to rhesus factor. You know, like who is doing it? I mean, most normal people aren't doing that. You know, uh, as I said, I'm probably a bit of a geek, abnormal person with a bit of a, you know, uh, OCD and probably some, you know, some other conditions in there which, which caused me to want to see the connections and understand, you know, how that works and to really go into it. And so that's why I'm able to come up with a book like that. But it also means I'm very, I, I look at these arguments and I think, hmm, so when did, you know, this factor appear? And stuff like that. What I find is, you know, it doesn't add up to what I'm being told through the alternative view. And that, you know, in fact, that, you know, what they're telling me is just spurious nonsense with no basis in reality. So, you know, I'd like to think that people look at my work and see that, you know, I'm, I'm providing them an argument. They can go away and check and say, look, you know, he's not just plucking this out of thin air or pulling it out of the hat. You know, these are real studies. And that, you know, where I find anomalies, you know, I flag anomalies. I'm not saying that this is like, oh, okay, it's just really boring, you know, you know, specs on your eyes kind of lab coat story. Because it's not. There's a lot of, like, like amazing stuff that's happened in human history. And there's a lot of mysteries. And, like, this book focuses on the human journey. But, I mean, alongside this, there is obviously the mysteries of lost civilizations. There's, you know, I'm certainly, I suspect that we probably have done this before, you know, risen to a technological level. Hard to prove, but, you know, again, you know, as I say, these things are in the back of my mind. Do I believe it's happened? Yes, I believe it's happened. Can I prove it? No. So it's not in my book, you know. So but you know, people shouldn't take it as I'm saying that all of this is bullshit because I'm not. I'm just saying, look, I'm looking to find you the evidence that you can turn around to your mum and dad and to your best mate and the bloke at work and say, you know what? There was a lost civilization and not have them laugh at you because you can say, no, no, look at what Bruce has got in his book. This is verifiable, objective evidence, reference to mainstream scientists that there was this. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do, something different to what I've been used to reading typically from other people, um, where, you know, you, most people will admit they don't get like they'll, they'll argue with me on Ancient Aliens forums about how true it is. But OK, take your ass into work and tell your boss <laughs> that ancient aliens created people because you're so you're so fucking convinced you've got the evidence well put up or shut the fuck up because if you have got that evidence you should be telling your mum you should be telling the guy at work you know you should be telling your best mate your girlfriend that you've got the evidence that aliens did it right because if you can only argue with me on fucking facebook and say that it's all true then you're full of shit you know that that's underlying it is what i think when i argue with people i think yeah yeah you know you, you're all front with me but I bet you don't have the balls to try and say that this stuff's true to people in your day-to-day -day reality because you know you haven't got that evidence and that you just have a really strong faith, you know. So there's, there's two different things here. I will argue my points with people. If I believe something, I will take my ass along and I will tell people. I've told everyone I've worked with, if you ask anyone I've ever worked with, and they tell you, what do I talk about at work? They'll tell you. He talks about ancient civilizations, aliens, all sorts of weird shit. But I back up what I say as best as I fucking can with evidence. And like, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. So, you know, I, I don't mind people attacking my stuff. I will put my evidence out there. Uh, what, what, what have you, what pushback have you gotten? Like, uh, obviously uh, you, you've talked about uh, uh, people that you work with whom, you know, you, ha you've had discussions with or people on Facebook. Have you had academic mm -hmm. or just standard colloquial uh, everyday people saying like, no, like, uh, you know, Bruce, you're, you're full of shit. Like it was actually the aliens and this is why it's the aliens. Like you, has this happened? Yeah, people, yeah, people sort of say that, yeah. I've had people sort of say, you know, yeah, that or, of course, the Bible version that, you know, all of it's true, not true because of the Bible, you know, and that people weren't alive beyond 6,000 years ago. Um, or, yeah, that, you know, you're, you're missing the bit where, you know, aliens did it. But those people just are not willing to provide you evidence. They just tell you that that's how it happened. And, you know, that's it. And you're supposed to just believe them. And if you don't, they get angry and they just like block you or whatever, you know, so... So to me, that's not really a debate. And it? if it's just, you know, you're an asshole because you don't believe me, you're blocked. You know, it's like, well, you know, really? That's like, that's it, is it? That's what I'm supposed to take it on? It's just that a complete stranger told me and they offered no evidence. And because I didn't believe him immediately, there's something wrong with me. I mean, is that like what it's supposed to be truth-seeking is now about? I mean, that, 
it doesn't feel like truth seeking. You know, if I just believe random Facebook people's claims, you know, which are completely unsubstantiated, you know, or just because there's 20 of them saying the same thing, it makes it true or something, you know, and that's what it usually seems to turn into. Like if I question, like, okay, aliens built Puma Punku, right? It's a, a, a classic claim, which has been promoted again and again and again, you know, that the, the evidence of the stonework at Puma Punku means it must be aliens, right? It's like, no, it doesn't. Like, look, I've been, look, I've been to Egypt, right? I can tell you what, you can see stone crafting of a quality far beyond Puma Punku all over the place in Egypt, you know, from older periods, going back a couple of thousand years or more. Puma Punku is supposed to be about 700 years old, right? Okay, ancient <clears throat> Egypt, 5,000 years of stonework going on there. And some of it is, you look at it and you think, my God, that must have been made in a factory with like robot laser technology precision, right? Because you're looking, it looks brand new, you know, glass smooth stone surfaces. And then they point a Puma Punku and say, you know, aliens must have made that. Look, if aliens made that, then we have to just fold the cards and say, aliens made every building basically ever, every anywhere, because we're shit at making stuff and only aliens can make good buildings. You know, and I think that's a like a ludicrous argument that, you know, we know that there was ancient stonemasons who worked to incredible high standards and that did polish, finish their stones and, you know, did make things look, you know, that they were cut almost to laser precision. But if you measure, you know, particularly Puma Punku, you measure the angles and stuff, you find that they're not perfect right angles, you know, and you find that there are errors, you know. You also find that the stone is not as hard as that we're told. It's not diorite and no, stuff. You know, there's most it's red sandstone and it's um some of it is a harder stone, not diorite, I forgot on the name. But these are stones that can be worked with the available tools. Basically you we know that the culture there had brass because they found brass smelting kits, right? So brass tools plus stone tools are sufficient for working the stones that you find on site at Puma Punku. But I'm not saying it would have been easy, because it wouldn't be. But you know, we know that these people, when you, they go about building a sacred structure, it's not about easiness. You know, they're willing to put in the time, the effort. The Egyptians put in immense efforts to build sacred structures. So we're not saying it's like, yeah, they just come in and chisel in a day. You know, it, it could be lifetimes to finish a temple. You know, we don't know. You know, sometimes it can take a long time. But they are working to high standards. They want it to be perfect. You know, and I, I just, I find it, it's, a, it's a shame that people default to this thing of that it looks so good, it must be aliens. You know, instead of, wow, you know, the crafting skills of some of these ancient cultures were really cool, you know, and that they've managed to do this. So that to me, you know, these arguments of the, you know, again, I, I've not personally seen any convincing evidence that aliens have directly built any stone structure on this planet. And I don't believe an advanced extraterrestrial race would work with these megalithic blocks. And so I don't see the logic to it because like if I can fly, like conceptualize like a type two or type three civilization that can like travel through the universe using wormhole technologies, has, you know, a vast starship that comes into orbit, lands in its robot drones, they survey the surface, you know, and then they think, well, we need a base. Send down the nanobots, you know, just reconstruct the material there and build us some sort of, you know, a carbon fiber geodesic dome with atmosphere control so we can go down there and live, right? That's what a type two civilization does or something. You know what I mean? You don't get there and say, now go down with your hammers, boys, and build us some rock shelters. <laughs> what the fuck? You know, you've come there in a starship from the other side of the fucking universe through a wormhole and you're building with some fucking bricks. I mean, that's all your shit you've got, some drills and stuff. I mean, like fucking, you know, heaven help me. You know, if that's if that's the technology we're giving these aliens, we're really under, we're underselling the aliens and we're underselling our ancestors at the same time. Because there's no fucking, there's no fucking way that, that you've got the technology to travel across the universe, but you have to build Puma fucking Punku, you know, as your base of operations. Like, I just, I'm not buying it. I'm not fucking buying it. <laughs> it's it, it, it's like we were expecting uh you know advanced uh advanced spacefaring civilization we got giant fucking duplo blocks <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's it. it doesn't it's make like, any sense i mean we know that we're on the cusp of these technologies right yeah we know that in a hundred years i won't be living in like you know well, i won't be alive but my children my, my descendants they won't be living in like a red brick house or something you know nanobots and stuff will literally be able to you know, reconstruct materials from base materials that are found in a location. We know that we, this technology is already there in the background, that we know we, they're building these mini nanobots that you can terraform with, you know, and we know that there's going to be 
advances, astonishing advances in the next hundred years, if we haven't wiped ourselves out. You know, we've already got this sort of EM drive technology coming in, which, you know, can conceivably take us to Mars in 70 days. Um, you know, we've got these, we're right on that cusp. And, you know, and, if you, and if you accept some of the stories and whispers, you know, breakaway parts of the government, probably in the black ops, already have these kind of technologies anyway. But the public always, there's the filter down technologies um, where, you know, we, we can see, though, that it doesn't make sense that, that we will go out into the universe and arrive there with, like, you know, pneumatic drills and hammers and stuff. You know, it, like, I, I don't believe you. You know, if, if someone puts that argument to me, it's just totally unreasonable, totally unreasonable. Like, we see, you know, there's some precision in some places, but there's, there's nothing that really stinks of, like, alien involvement. Where I think we can see things is maybe in knowledge transfer, mm. that, you know, that there's sometimes there seems to be some sudden leaps in knowledge or there's understandings of the cosmos we wouldn't expect and things like that, that, you know, the transfer of information from non-human intelligences, I believe, is is quite... You know, I think it happens, you know, but I think it happens in different ways. I think that potentially it's happened through altered states of consciousness for a start. We know that people have been communing with non-human entities through altered states since the dawn of time, you know, and that these entities give useful, helpful, you know, practical information, right? Including stories like the flood. People were told that there was going to be a fucking big flood. And they didn't say just some guy told them. You know, it was beings or entities or gods or, you know, that they in these altered states, somebody was telling their shamans and the priests, look, man, there's this real bad shit coming. You know, take your people and get the fuck out of here. So, I mean, that sort of information, I think, is always being transferred to us from somewhere. And then also, you know, yeah, people have very believable contacts with with physical seeming aliens, you know, that there's everyday Joes that are taken up into you know, into what seem to be craft, or they have experiences that lend themselves to being, you know, what sounds like they are taken somewhere. And they're shown things. They're shown, like, consistent technologies, you know, that we, they're shown things that appear again and again in accounts. You know, they're told information that appears again and again in accounts. So, I mean, I do accept that there's knowledge transfer from non-human beings, whether they're physical or non-physical, right? But I, I take that line of research very differently to this one of that they landed and built the pyramids and they built the Mayan temples and they built this and they built that. There, there's no real reason why they need to build all those things. Those things serve human interests and human needs. You know, they don't serve alien needs. So, I mean, it's, I think there's a, there's a problem in this when we put everything into one story that, you know, the people said that the gods came or the people said the gods talked to them. Therefore, the gods must have landed and done everything, built everything, set up the society, you know, done all of the work. Like, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that we have to sort of rationally look at that and say, yeah, OK, we've got a fair case for influence from beyond of some sort, but a very poor case for direction. OK, I think we lost, lost that last one. Uh, I know that we're uh, a good 20,000 kilometers Sorry. apart. And the Internet can sometimes be a little wonky when talking with uh, Australia, but uh, mm -hmm. you said the, the last part, you said that there was no clear case of uh, any extraterrestrial sort of building. Yeah. Building, yeah, building these buildings. Okay. You know, that's, yeah, it's a very different argument. Now, because we're, 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 we are nearing the end of the program and I, I did have one question uh, for myself as well. I know that Lee from uh, Chad is asking uh, your, your thoughts on AI. Um, and how, I, well, just basically your thoughts on AI. I know, I know that there's a lot of talk nowadays of that essentially being potentially the, the way that we go out. Um, you know, the, the AI realizes that, hey, why the hell are these humans here telling me what to do when, you know, I could just do things myself. And I know that we've even touched on certain things uh, with, um, with regards to megalithic uh, structures just barely. And I know that we haven't even talked to any, uh, any about in Australia. So I'd like to be able to get your opinion yeah, on sorry, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we should probably have given a bit more of the um the overview of yeah why australia but um well let's, what do you want me to do do i tackle the ai or tackle australia or well let's, let's say tackle t tackle australia see if we can transition into ai and then we'll we'll close up okay yeah the, look the argument i put forward basically is that rather than um like we've already covered that you know homo erectus came out of of Africa, they were widespread, you know, 1.8 million years ago. Uh, one million years ago, they have reached Indonesia, 
Right. Once you cross over what's called the Wallace Line, which is a, a, geo, a, geologic, a geographic geological division down in, in Indonesia, which divides Australasia from Southeast Asia, right? Um, that's why you have on one side you have mammals, on the other side you have marsupials, right? Mm -hmm. So large mammals have never crossed, okay? One million years ago, the first hominin group to cross, you know, arrives on Flores. You know, it's, considered in, it's considered in sort of human terms that once anyone crosses the Wallace Line, it's inevitable that they will soon after reach Australia because there is no longer any real barrier, okay? All the fast currents and all of that has been crossed. So if you've made it that far, you're within a short step to Australia. So my argument is that these people inevitably reached Australia almost immediately afterwards. And that what we have is the problem we have, and people say, well, where's all their bones? under that sea level rise. Because, you know, as we said earlier, we've had an enormous sea level rise. The coastline of Australia has been enormously reduced. So all of the arrival sites are now deep under the sea. So we don't see bones there, you know, of a million years ago because they're deep under the sea. So what instead we find is we have evidence of the much later settlements, which go back at the moment to, well, the very earliest evidence that's, I guess, scientific if you like it's about 120,000 years ago there's, there's evidence of, of what we call fire stick farming in parts of australia that go back 120,000 years like um at, i think it's lake victoria and also the great barrier reef uh, there's also there's been some genomes detected in people in the northeast that suggest that they were from a group that arrived 120,000 years ago so this date's come up a few times and then the sites themselves uh, the oldest sites are suggesting up to about 80,000 years ago. There's mm -hmm. a site in the north, 65 to 80,000. Another one in the south, that's 70 to 80,000. So we we know that we have these, there's a gap, basically. You know, So I'm arguing that the first hominins arrived and that there in Australia, they underwent accelerated evolution. And this is something Mitch Ukeku recently spoke on. He said, you know, Australia is unique because once there, there'd have been a completely new, unique environment with unique flora and fauna which would have led to an isolated population going through accelerated evolution. So th there's nowhere else like it on the planet. So those people that arrived suddenly had enormous evolutionary pressures, right? And I believe it's there where the, the split occurs 800,000 years ago, not that long after they've come in from Flores, uh, that we have this sudden split into multiple lineages, like the Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, I'm sure many others. I believe there's an anomalous event there and that will appear in another argument in a separate book. Um, I, I'm not putting it here because I'd like to put the evidence with it. There is an anomalous event 800,000 years ago. I'll put it, put it that way. And that I believe that then later on, that we can see that there's waves of humans moving up from Australia into Southeast Asia, into China, East Asia, and then spreading across Eurasia, back into Africa, and also into Europe. And and that's the, the model here. And one of those waves is around... 300,000 years ago, if we based on the finds in Morocco, uh, Jebel Al Hud, which mm. recently was famous. Look where Morocco is. You know, I'm pretty sure those people jumped across from Spain, that they weren't just wandering around Africa. In Morocco is a perfect place to arrive in Africa, right, on a boat. Mm. Uh, and then also the other place where you find very old uh, Homo sapiens is East Africa, very near to the entrance point of Babel Mandab. So funnily enough, the oldest fossils in Africa are all at entrance sites as if people were coming in, right? Um, and then you find there's a later wave. And I, some of these people may have gone in and done all right and come back out. Uh, in fact, there's evidence 150,000 years ago of, of Homo sapiens encountering the descendants of Homo agaster in Africa for the first time in, one, in, a, you know, in over a million years because they recently found that there's a saliva gene which has been linked to a ghost population in Africa. And people have read that article. Uh, and they say 150, around 150,000 years ago, African ancestors interbred with a ghost population that may have been the descendants of Homo agaster. And the thing is, that tells you something because that tells you that we've been cut off from those Homo agaster descendants until 150,000 years ago. If we were living alongside them, why is there suddenly uh, evidence that we've interbred with them 150,000 years ago? We would have been interbreeding with them the whole time, mm -hmm. right? So we've been cut off from Africa for a vast period since Homo erectus left. And we return around about 300 to 200,000 years ago and begin to move down into Africa until we meet these people about 200 to 150,000 years ago. And then another wave comes out of the, the Asian region. 
later on. I mean, we've got at this point, and I do try this quickly just so people got the idea of the model. So from this point onwards, Eurasia, Africa, Australia are populated from 300,000 years ago onwards. There's going to be pockets of humans of various types all across. Right. And then we have the disaster at 73,000 years ago, which eradicates almost all Eurasian hominins. A few Neanderthals survive in Western Europe and up in the north have adapted to the cold uh, and they manage to survive in pockets also in, in the Middle East. But everywhere else, they're dead. The Denisovans, almost all of them are dead. Right. Most of the modern humans in, in Eurasia are dead. What we have is two survival pockets below the equator. One's in sub-Saharan Africa. And one is in Australasia. For a very long time, only one of those was recognized, which was the sub-Saharan Africans. And that was why the default model was out of Africa, because it was believed that we weren't anywhere else. But now we're finding evidence of 120,000 year old presence in Australasia, which blows that out of the water. Because then you have to say, well, what about these people? They obviously weathered the storm, too. You know, and then it's this is, and then this is sort of the main point that people are interested. Sixty thousand years ago, the pop the repopulating of Eurasia begins. It's not a colonization because people used to live there, uh, but they've been wiped out. And what we find is that sixty thousand years ago, people moved back into Eurasia. That the first places they appear are Southeast Asia, then East Asia, Central Asia, and finally they get to the Middle East, then Europe, then North Africa. Which way is that moving? Is it moving out of Africa? It doesn't sound like it to me. And this is all that's all validated. You can check check the genetic data and you'll find the, the older populations are over in the east and they're moving westward. And this has always been an anomaly in the out of Africa model, which is why they said perhaps we raced out of Africa, ran along the coasts of South Asia, ran into Australia and then moved backwards. And that was where there was this big illogical leap that couldn't be substantiated by any evidence at all. Just this, this gripping on to this, we must have come out of Africa, when all the evidence the whole time has pointed to us coming out of Australia. And now we know that we have sites older than 60,000 years in Australia and that this is perfectly positioned as a survival zone for Toba and that these people emerged and repopulated Eurasia. And that's why the Eurasians and the Asians are genetically closer to Australian Aboriginals than they are to Africans and that all of those populations are closer to each other than to Africans. And for, for uh, McAllis, who's asking, uh, how, how would this uh, reference or connect back to the uh, seven uh, mitochondrial uh, daughters of Eve? Is it, like, again, that, that's that's related to the idea of, uh, you know, a, mito- mi- mi- a mitochondrial originator, which, mm-hmm. as we've talked about, you know, originates up to about 158,000 years ago. So that, yeah. that would have been the starting point of the repopulation of Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. All you have to say to that is basically, yeah, you know, there would have been like Eves. You mm-hmm. know, obviously, the problem is that lineages just die off. So we don't know how many Eves there was. The further back you go, the more Eves there would have been, you know, until some of those lineages die off. But anyway, the, the, the point is that when they first came up with the idea, it was said, you know, and this woman was probably in Africa. Right. But that probably yeah, is a key word there, because there literally is no way to geographically place her, right? So it was just assumed that she was probably in Africa because, well, a lot of Afri- a lot of fossils in Africa, most of the older fossils, so probably she was there too. But there was absolutely no reason why she couldn't have been down in, a, in either Australasia or Southeast Asia. And now we know that the genetics are, are supporting the presence of early Homo sapiens, and not just the genetics, the fossils in China particularly, uh, are showing us that there was not only was there a Homo erectus, but there is a wealth of transitional forms between 900,000 to 150,000 years ago, uh, which we see are becoming like Neanderthal-like or Hydrogensis-like, Denisovan-like potentially, because there's some anomaly ones, and also home, uh, archaic Homo sapiens, right? We don't see that in Africa. We don't. There's a, there's a big hole in the African record up until 300,000 years ago when we have Jebel Erhud, right? There's uh, before that, if you ask any paleontologist, OK, or where's the fossils for the Homo sapiens ancestors in Africa before that? Zero. What about in East Asia? Lots. Right. So that, that's a problem. So I'm going to put that Eve where she should have been in the first place, which is over in the east, not in Africa. And, and oh, again, sorry, I should just add that. Remember what I said earlier? Mm-hmm. The oldest African DNA we have is 8000 years old. So using DNA alone. You cannot place any of these ancestral beings in Africa. And that, that line that DNA places people in Africa is, is based on a huge baseless assumption. 
And how, how would this fit into the theory of, I know that there's one uh, theory which Michaelis has talked about uh, regarding the origins of civilizations being in Ireland. Uh, again, I've also heard the same thing of, uh, you know, the origin of civilization being in the Andes. I've, I've heard it being in mm-hmm. Easter Island. It's, there's, you know, there, there are a lot of peoples who will say, well, you know, civilization or originated in one area, but, you know, as, as we've said, the, the main, at least your main premise from what I can understand is that, mm-hmm. okay, well, it's, you know, it started in Africa, you know, 2 million years ago, mm-hmm. went East, big, uh, mm-hmm. you know, big event happened, several big events happened, and then yeah. it migrated back into Africa, which, um, mm-hmm. You know, I I think is at least something that a lot of mainstream, uh, a lot of mainstream scientists they really need re- really need to look at, because as you mm-hmm. said, well, you're the guy who did this in his bedroom, and you were able to put the pieces <laughs> together. They don't which, like that. No, they don't. That's why you don't see my book talked about in any in any sort of. I've sent my book to skeptics to review. I send it to scientists. I send you know I send stuff to the journalists. They do not want to talk. They would not even attack me. They will not put any public focus at all. There's no attempt to debunk me. There's no attempt at all to discuss this in public. And um, some scientists will talk to me in private, but nobody will put this in the public eye because they can't easily dismiss me. If it was a joke, you'd see it on Yahoo News tomorrow. Silly theorist from England says we started in Australia, right? The reason you nobody is seeing that anywhere is because I can't be easily dismissed. And they really hate it when they can't when they can't do that. If they if they can't dismiss you, they'll just ignore you. Or yeah, that's it. Death by silence is the other. Way. You know, if they can't take you down, then they'll just ignore you and make sure the journalists won't talk. I have journalists say, "Yeah, send me the details." I send them the details. I never hear from them again. And if I chase them, they never reply again. Once they see that I'm arguing against out of Africa, that's it. You never hear from them again. There, there's a very similar, well, not very similar thing that happened to. At least I'm going to say it's very similar. Uh, recently, the the CBC, which is uh, very similar to the ABC in Australia, um, it there was a documentary which uh, was shown that argues the Solutrean theory uh, for migration during the last ice age uh, from Europe into mm-hmm. North America, and uh, yeah. indigenous groups were screaming um, uh, racism. Uh, due to the theory being presented, because it's like, well, you know, the, the accepted theory is that we were here first, then anything else mm-hmm. is considered racism. So there is also that other side where if it goes against yeah. the theory and it's, it's it, if it's, uh, if the scientists can't, um, uh, ca- can't look at it or, t- or attack it on a logical basis, they're going to attack it mm-hmm. using ad hominem attacks, or they're just going to ignore it. Uh, the same mm-hmm. thing with with the political sphere when it comes to uh, archaeological evidence. They're going to politicize and they're going to they're going to uh, use uh, you know attacks that are that are meant to shock and they're meant to you know anger people because it's like nobody wants to be thought of a racist for for trying to think of something in a scientific manner. No. Um, and you know again there, there's a difference between uh, you know looking at a scientific manner from a theory of something that some people say was disproven. Although I don't think that was mm-hmm. actually. I don't think that it was actually disproven because there are um, uh, spear points which do point to the theory possibly being or having some credence to mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And this is the same thing I've I've heard over and over and over again. The same you know the same thing with with ha- anything from Hancock, the anything with with uh, mm-hmm. Randall Carlson that is just constantly attacked. And it, it it takes a very brave soul to to put yeah. uh, you know put their thoughts on paper and put it out there for the world to see. Um, mm-hmm. Now. For things that haven't come up, I know that you've got a new book that you're working on that we're not going to discuss because we're just going to say, wait for the sequel. We'll have him back on yeah. hopefully when it comes out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to close out, um, what do you have, what are your thoughts on AI and where it's taking us? I know it's completely out of left field, but Lee always asks the uh, mm-hmm. out of left field questions. And it's, it's always nice to get people's uh, opinions on this because you seem like a very sharp guy. So Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah I mean... Yeah. I mean, I, I do see, you know, technology is um, is a double edged sword. You know, we know that with any advanced technologies we're working on, you know, the same as like the worries that we had with um, with nanotechnologies, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that we could create this. What's it called? The the gray cloud or whatever, you know, the, this gray goo where, where it would go run amok and the, the nanobots would convert all of us into just a, a gray slime or something, you know, and that'd be the end of you know, humanity mm. that, you know, again, with AI, that we have that problem where, you know, it can solve, you know, incredible problems, you know, that if we can allow AI to take over sort of mundane operations that, you know, other people are doing that we don't necessarily need to do, you know, we could have an AI do it, that, yeah, it's, okay, streamlines civilization. Obviously, those people will lose their jobs. So it's not good for them on a personal level. Um, but that, yeah, we can see that. And of course, you have AI running our 
technologies, running our spacecraft, you know. I can see that there's like incredible things you can do with it. But the worry is that that when we see the the leadership of our of our, our civilizations at the moment, you know, things are not generally done for the benevolence, you know, of the people. Um, so, you know, what we really see in it is intelligent computer systems that that analyze your data in microseconds and decide whether, you know, you're a valid component of society or, you know, whether you're some kind of threat or a useless eater. Uh, and then, the, you know, maybe your insurance premiums go up, your your job is lost, your health is worked out, you can't have health insurance. And, you know, you have all these analytic process done by faceless you know well not even <laughs> it's computers computers is making decisions that once upon a time a human with compassion and with empathy would analyze and do or would make you know think of what's in the best interest of humans i mean there's this idea of what's in the best interest of the species and like the global whole and maybe ai is really good in that respect but when you think of what's good for individuals i think there's a lot of individuals will find that they suffer greatly by the implications of having ai take over you know processes and work um so i mean i i would have like some deep concerns about the way in which you know we we go in that direction because there's there's sort of safe uses of ai and there's dangerous uses and and then of course there's yeah the idea of overly human-like ai i don't know if we can ever really have a true conscious ai uh, I, i'm i'm not sure i wouldn't say no because the, the fundamental thing is we don't really understand the nature of consciousness. We don't know where it emerged from, like, but we assume that it's at some stage emerged from non-living, non-organic physical matter, right? So if it's done it once, can it do it twice? You know, so we, we do have to worry a little bit about that. It's not necessarily even just how advanced the code is. Because if, if consciousness is a, like, you know, an emergent property of matter, which I think it is, you know, because it seems it has to have emerged at some point, doesn't it, from physical matter, right? No matter if it was here or an alien world, at some point, consciousness emerged from physical matter. Mm. So, like, if that doesn't freak you out a bit, you know, it should, because if we have if we have a computer, you know, that is made of stuff that contains consciousness at the inherent, you know, sub quantum level, and we give it this kind of this infrastructure to work from to exp to sort of express itself. You know, what would that new consciousness be like? I mean, so and it wouldn't necessarily be anything to do with the codes that we put in it. It would simply take over the codes, take over the systems and utilize them, you know, like a little baby that doesn't know what it's doing. And it's just like playing with all this, these toys. So I do see that danger. And I, I think that comes from that materialist view that the materialists don't see those dangers because they say, well, you know, unless and there's a compound in a stream is hit by lightning and, and all the compounds come together and somehow it makes DNA. It's like so I, I don't believe that that's how it happened. I don't believe you. And I, I don't believe that consciousness just comes out of your brain. I, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. So so they don't see a problem with that because they have a, a really strange reductionist worldview, which, you know, and, and because of that, they could really put the rest of us at risk because they're not willing to look at the objective argument there for, look, consciousness could just emerge any fucking time into that system. And we won't know what that consciousness is like or what it wants to do with us. So I do see an inherent danger in that. But also those other points I make, you know, that just the way we use AI without even getting to that level, just the way humans would use AI and the people that lead us would use AI is a terrible concern because we don't have egalitarian governments. All that and the fact I think at this point we have AI a face swapping porn that is now being released. Yeah, uh, we have really strange stuff already, and we always see in it. You know, if humans can find a way to misuse a technology, like we'll find it pretty fast, you know. You know, so you know, and like they want to, you know, have AI weapons of war, you know, with battle robots that are, you know, that can basically. <laughs> you've probably seen this. But they have. They want to make an autonomous battle robot that could feed on on organic matter i.e you know it could conceivably consume the bodies of the dead propelling itself forward and running independently on its own ai <laughs> i mean really that's a fucking good idea now is it it's a horrible fucking idea <laughs> it's like zombie robots this is it's, it's even worse than terminator it's like it's gonna kill you and then it's gonna eat yeah. the kids it's gonna kill you and eat you yeah i mean like it, what why is someone thinking in it when they see it in their in their lab and they think Hmm, I know what a good idea would be, you know, a self-propelled autonomous battle robot that eats people. Hmm. And they get like an award, you know, for, for designing that. And you just be like, is that our society now then? It's pretty, if that's what you get an award for, like we're pretty messed up as a species, you know, I mean, that's, so I don't know, I don't think we're ready for advanced AI in, in the current state that we're in. 
<coughs> no. <laughs> Goodness, no. Uh, and at that, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking like the, the the two things that we always do with every single piece of new technology is three or sorry three things: learn how to kill each other with it, make money from it, mm-hmm. and then have sex with it or use it to simulate sex in some way. Those those are the yeah. three basic mm-hmm. things that we. That's you know, right. If there's food mm-hmm. in there somewhere, then sure. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, at least um, I know that we've got individuals like Elon Musk who are at least talking out against this type of shit. We've got very smart people who are like, well, mm-hmm. you don't want to do this. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. he's rich. He got rich somehow. He must be pretty smart. I think maybe he might mm-hmm. have a point. <laughs> so, are, are you familiar with, um, like, um, is it Black Mirror? Have you seen the Black Mirror shows? I have not actually seen Black Mirror. No, okay. I mean, I would advise anyone out there to watch them because, you know, it's like dy- you know, dystopian views of where our technologies go. And um, I forgot the name, the guy that writes them, but, you know, he's very visionary and like, you know, has, has kind of foreseen, you know, where things like not just like where social media goes, where AI will go uh, and where all these, you know, the, the, the problems, you know, that very realistically thought out future problems, not distant future, you know, imminent future problems with some of these AI. Um, and, you know, I think that, yeah, we probably have done this before. I mean, I'll give you a, I know you haven't got much time, but I'll give you what I consider like a worrying example um, that perhaps we've done this before is that like all around the world like you've got these stories of like like sort of shamans and medicine men who would stare into a handheld polished onyx black mirrors right and then they would scry the world and know all knowledge through their little black mirrors now you look around i see people everywhere scrying the world through their handheld black mirrors you know and like, when you think of that description that's fucking frightening because yeah, you know, have have we sit done this before? Why is it the, the elders tell us, oh yeah, you know, once upon a time, you know, you could stare into your black mirror and know all things in all places, and like here I am, I can pick up my, you know, my phone and I can stare into it and see things in all places. Now, if that isn't a frightening sort of like coincidence, I don't know what fucking is because that sounds to me like you know we've got to that level before at some point, and it's in those oral stories. You know, and I know that that's it's difficult to prove, as I say, like to find the new parts to prove it. But if you just take the oral warning there, that it does sound like maybe we've done some of this before in the vast cycles of time that, um, yeah, we should be very cautious. Um, and I, I, so I don't know if you've got a couple of minutes, but I mean, in a, in a book here, I've got that. Um, I can't remember what it is anyway, but anyway, it talks, I think it's in the book of Enoch, isn't it? I think that they talk about the angels kind of say to him that when when humanity uh, takes the, the like steals the knowledge of the angels and then practices black magic and sorcery that they have to be culled back again and that, that that's the sort of the trigger and you look now and like you hear you know you hear the stories of the advanced technology being misused in black ops projects which conceivably is what would be called the knowledge of the angels you know um, that were able to do things that are like magic and that these people are associated with what seems to be a cult nefarious practices that these exposed networks of child abuse and satanic child abuse you know if that isn't the black magic and stuff you know so for anyone who takes those kind of old stories seriously you know you, you look at that in the book of enoch and you think my god that sounds like now no oh, that's a very big it's a very good possibility um yeah, it's the subject for another show <laughs> we got to talk about it at some point <laughs> but for, but for now i uh, ladies and gentlemen i'm i'm going to you know i'm, I'm going to pick some see if i can actually get some good outro music for you here so one that's not going to get me a uh, a flag for uh for copyright i keep getting copyright flags which is kind of annoying uh that one's already been played that one's already been played that's yeah, you know i'll just now let's go to the usual one it's there we go this is uh from my, my friend abe van dam this is shake it so ladies and gentlemen don't forget to shake it up this weekend have yourself a good time thank you very much uh, bruce for being on the show if you just want to wait around for a second just so i can i can talk you out and uh for, for all ladies and gents uh next week um i'm going to be releasing the lineup for february starting next week uh, that'll be on monday or tuesday along with all the episodes that were uh, leading up till now i've got two bonus episodes to do still so i'll hopefully have those up if i've got time this weekend and uh february is going to be a fantastic month uh sleep well chase that sunrise and we will see you all next week <laughs>